who an entrepreneur in London has come up with a novel way in order to help people achieve their dream. What is it? You got a dream? Maybe if you have a dream. What's your dream? Dream. Dream. 23% of businesses fail in the first year. 23%. And this is where the stats don't stack up. They're used to put people off living their dream. Don't link failure to not making money. It's a f***ing lie. At peak, what sort of turnover were you doing? Tens of millions. Just because you give people the basic human right need, they need purpose. Mm. £50,000 worth of debt. Yep. And I asked them, what are the four ways you make money on TikTok? Couldn't tell me. Banks lent us money to buy a house. Bought a house. We closed the door. We forgot that we're actually meant yeah. to be helping the person at the end of the street who's struggling. Monopoly was invented by a woman to highlight the problem when you put property and capitalism together. I'm a capitalist, but I believe there's a line to be drawn. It didn't take as long to get to conspiracy theories, it did, did it? <laughs> AI should relieve the human race of the slavery that they are locked into. What a line that is, Simon. So we shouldn't be trying to save the planet. We should be trying to save the human race. How much money do you reckon you've given away? <laughs> so, um... Simon, welcome to the show, mate. It's good to be here. We've finally done it. Finally. I, I, this has been a long time in the making. It is, isn't it? We first met on Clubhouse probably three years ago. Some of your audience won't even know what that is. No, I know. That's how old we're getting. Yeah. <laughs> it's an app that's two years old. It's a shame it didn't work out, that. Well, it worked out. I mean, this is the interesting thing about failure, isn't yeah. it? Did it fail? Not for me. I mean, I know you. I, I made some serious friends from that app yeah. during that time. And during lockdown, it kind of helped me uh, help people. I, I, I enjoyed it. It allowed us all talk. Wasn't yeah, it, to random people, and all of a sudden you're meeting all these contacts. Like, wow, it's yeah. pretty cool. I did go on the app uh, yesterday, knowing I was going to see you today, and uh, there are still people, oh, people on it. On it yeah, there's, there's at least six people there. Oh wow! Um, but I, I, I wouldn't recommend people. No, bother. No, 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 fair play. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up, and how did you become a multi-millionaire to become a massive influencer right now? So, <laughs> big question to start with. I, I, um, <laughs> well, I think. To be blunt, I'm a multimillionaire today because I was lucky. And this yeah. isn't talked about enough. Yeah. People always talk about how brilliant they are, how skilled they are. Um, I, I was lucky. Mm. And I think luck is, turns out, a skill. And you Absolutely. can hack luck. And there are ways you can influence luck. You can increase the chances of luck. But we are told a lie that the harder you work, the luckier you get. That's the mainstream belief about luck. About luck mm. And that is not true. I, I, right. I, I agree with you. Yeah. I think the more risks you take, the luckier you get. The more risk you take, mm. it's a formula. It's risk and learning to love fear mm. and learning to lean into fear, learning to use fear as a superpower, which is what it's meant to be. Originally, fear was designed, a lion's coming towards us. We can run faster, you know, when yeah. we fear. We can think differently, mm. completely differently. It's a different part of the brain completely. And we should be leveraging it. But in this day and age, we've learned to say no. And fear turns off and somehow it feels more comfortable and it makes us weak. Mm. And so fear, leaning into it, Knowing your destination is quite important as well for luck. Yeah. Knowing where you're going, and not enough people do. Mm. They get in a car and don't know their destination. Why, why do you wonder where well, you run out of petrol or mm. you run out of energy or your car breaks down? You haven't, you haven't decided where you want to go. Mm. And then I think, and it's cheesy and maybe woo-woo, but purpose. Mm. You know, why are you going to that destination? If you have those three things, your luck 10x is. 100%. And also lifestyle. Whoever sits in sound and goes, I want this lifestyle. This is what I want within five, 10 years. I want to have, be living this lifestyle, reverse engineer it and bring it back. No one ever plans that. No, of course not. You know, people are just going for the shiny objects. And well, if, you look at, if you look at the most successful people in the world and you study them, as I have done, because I've had 200 people on my podcast that are you know, super mm. successful entrepreneurs. And when you study them, you basically realize the most successful people who have the most amount of money are still actually working hard. Yeah. You know, and working hard can be sitting at a desk like Warren Buffett and reading all day. Mm. Um, you know, so it's not it's not about energy output necessarily, but they are the most successful and they're still going. Why? Because they found something they love they to do. They love. That's the key. Yeah. You know, I, the amount of business we run over the years and stuff here, creating our own business. I've never been employed in my life. I've always created own businesses. You know, a true entrepreneur since a young kid. But actually, fun is the key to business. Totally underrated word in business. Totally Fun. underrated. Like we're, I'm lucky in, in respect that we create sport music festivals, podcasts, everything that we do with nightclubs. It's bringing smiles to people's faces. And I love it because I'm bringing fun into the game. But the amount of people I've got friends who have got running business don't even enjoy it. Well, the problem is people, and I, I get pitched businesses all the time. Mm. I've invested in 77 companies in my career. Mm. And what I've noticed is that people get 
uh, an idea of what a successful business is. And often they start off with, I've discovered a niche and this is the niche I'm going to fill. Mm. And quite quickly, I say, well, what if you continue to work in this niche for the rest of your life? What if? Mm. And they literally go pale and like, no, no, don't worry. Amazon's going to buy it in three years time. I'm like, what if they don't? <laughs> yeah. You're stuck with it. Yeah. So people shouldn't be working on building a niche. They should literally be doing the cheesy thing or working on something fun. Mm. Mm. You can keep going when it's fun too. Mm. It's, you, it's nice you, to find a niche. It is nice to find a niche. If you can combine the two, it's it's interesting. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's a prerequisite. So I went to Hong Kong at 23 years mm. old and I started a creative agency. Mm. There was no niche. Mm. There was hundreds of equivalent companies doing exactly the same. But I liked helping companies come up with marketing strategies to get into China. Mm. I just enjoyed it. Mm. And so although there was hundreds of companies doing that exact niche, I still won. Mm. Why? Because I enjoyed it. Yeah. I enjoyed it more than the other people that were doing it because it for them was a business. Are you competitive? Of course. Yeah. So when you were going to China, when you were going into Hong Kong and creating up your agency, you were thinking, well, there's the competitors. Mm -hmm. I can do it better than them and I can create better relationships to get get people coming and pay me more money. Not exactly. No? I, I mean, don't get me wrong, that plays a part. Mm. I think actually I had the opposite, which was I looked at the competitors and had admiration for them. Mm. It's a bit like podcasts. I think if you look at your competitors in the podcast, quite often we admire them. Yeah. We look at what they're doing to improve ourselves. I think it's a much healthier way to look at competition. Mm. I, I look at competition in a healthy way and say, these people are doing it right. What can I learn? Yeah. But of course, equally, I say, and this actually happened to me when I went to Hong Kong. There was a company in Hong Kong called Mark and Chantel. They actually still are in Hong Kong. I respected them so much. Mm. Their branding, their office culture, the way they treated their staff, their client profile. They looked like they were having fun. And I remember thinking, wow, one day I hope that I can be like them. Mm. We became much bigger than them, mm. much more successful than them. But I respected them and I still do, even though since I've my company was 10x bigger and I sold it to PricewaterhouseCooper, I've, I've been more successful than them, you mm. could say financially. But I, I actually, they were my muse. Mm. And I think that's really healthy. Don't get into a space where there's no one you admire and you can't, competing is good, but admiration drives you to another level. I Absolutely. Think. So where did you grow up then? So I grew up in a, I want to say shitty little town, but then I'm going to name the town and then the people living there will hate me forever. Where, where was it? Uh, but I, I, I basically grew up in a town called St. Neots, um, which is 20 minutes from Cambridge and uh, right up the A1. A lot of people just drive by it. And I didn't know it was a shitty little town when I was growing up in it, frankly. I didn't know that the school system was basically getting me ideally to go work in the factory there that made Nissan car plant parts. I didn't realize the school system was was deliberately dumbing down my education so I'd go work in that factory. I thought it was a normal town that was doing all right. It had a golf course. I mean, that sounds posh, doesn't mm. it? And in fairness, the town has come up a few levels. Uh, but, you know, I think when I look back, uh, that town represents a lot of towns, I think, in England right now where people are, you know, it's not London, yeah. which is good. You know, costs of living are lower. Buying a house is is lower. But equally... And I discovered this moving to Hong Kong, which is the second most expensive place in the world to yeah. live. Right? First place? Japan. Yeah. People don't realise this. London's number 12 on the list. I think Sandbanks is uh, up there, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Well, Sandbanks up there, but it is globally, yeah. when you, Sandbanks is a seaside, seaside uh, just category. Just up the road. Exactly, yeah. near, near where this podcast footage, is being yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the actual, uh, in reality, the cost of living, mm. number one is Japan. Number Hong two Kong, is Hong yeah. Kong. Hong Kong's very expensive. L London's yeah. number 11, by the way. Is so it so when I moved back from Hong Kong to London and everyone's like, oh, London's so expensive. I'm like, it's not expensive. Yeah. Now, it all depends on other structures. So mm. in Hong Kong, the tax rate is 15% flat. Mm. So, so of course, you know, you can have more expensive things mm. because your costs of, of, of actual uh, taking money home and putting it on your bank is much lower. England's very hard to put yeah. money in the bank. Yeah, very. And the whole system here is all about getting 50 quid off you a month. Everybody's yeah. trying to get 50 quid off you a month. Mm. So I think that- Example? You know, well, Sky TV, yeah. I can't cancel the bloody thing. Yeah. I have literally tried 18 times to yeah. cancel it. And, and they have a system of getting you back in every time. Yeah. And right now, you know, Maybe Sky's a sponsor of this podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I, I basically think that they their whole system is about, they're not customer service oriented. They're about trapping people in. Yeah. But this is normal in England, I've discovered. Yeah. And the other thing that really shocked me when I came back from Hong Kong to England was the credit rating system. Mm. Like I had millions and millions of pounds in my bank. 
I get a house, I ask BT to install the internet broadband and they say you can't because you don't have a credit rating. They can't give me the monthly credit <laughs> to do it. So I then have to go and get a credit rating system set up for myself, mm. right? The first thing they tell me I have to do is get a credit card. So the first thing they tell me to get a credit rating, I need debt. It's bonkers, isn't it? So is, yeah. it, it, and that, that for me, um, I, I managed to avoid all that. And and, I, and what people don't realise, I think, is that these credit rating companies are private companies. They're actually not there to help you. Yeah. And they have literally created a system now that if you don't, if you want no debt, which I have no debt, yeah. I live debt free. I, I own my house outright. I own my car outright. Everywhere I turn left, right, and centre, someone's selling me debt. Yeah. In this country, it's non-stop. And in fact, you can't even get your internet connected unless you've got some sort of debt rating. Mm. And so they don't do it to help you get the broadband or get a car. They get it so they can judge how much to charge you and how much they could squeeze out of you every moment. And to control you. The more and more debt, the more you're- Didn't take as long to get to conspiracy theories, did it? <laughs> Um, I want to roll the whole bit. I, I want to. I want to know what your childhood was like. I want to know what, what happened that journey yeah. from Cambridge. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, my childhood, in fact, when I look back, was pretty pretty good. Hmm. Um, well, Cambridge is a nice area. Right? Well, like, I didn't live in Cambridge. Yeah, okay. Cambridge is a nice area. Yeah. I lived in St. Neots. Remember yeah. the shitty little town mm. where everybody living there is going to hate me at the end mm. of this podcast? <laughs> um, but I now try to help people get out of that shitty little yeah. town and do what they love, mm. right? Because I think you live in an isolation chamber in some of these towns in England. And I was definitely in an isolation chamber. Mm. So if you'd asked me at 15 years old what my upbringing was like in England, I would have said I lived in a, a four-bedroom house with a swimming pool. Right. We lived on a private street and we have a park right near us. And I went to a school that was all right. Yeah. Um, but when I review it back as an adult, mm. I realized the opposite. The school that I went to was training me to either be a hairdresser or go work in the local factory. They were the yeah. two aspirational. <laughs> most people are like, oh, Simon, you can earn 500 quid a week. You know, the day you leave school going to work for this factory, yeah. 500 quid a week, mate. Mm. You know, like as if it's, and it is a lot of money. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Even today, I'm not saying 500 quid. I, yeah. you know, I've worked hard to earn 500 quid a week, but I didn't. I didn't go get a 500 quid, quid a week factory job. I took a 10 quid a week self-employed route, mm. right? So you know, delay gratification. But when you're young, you just want 500 quid. Mm. So you go work in that factory, mm. but they don't teach you skills. And then the next thing you know, you're there for the rest of your life. Mm. And you're stuck. And you're you're stuck, trapped. Trapped. Yeah. The only yeah. way out is debt, and then yeah. debt traps you further. Yeah. So, and I've seen that mm. with many people that I grew up with mm. in that town, smart people that have got trapped. Mm. And there are some people that live there and are happy. And there's one thing I envy them. I wish I didn't know so much. Yeah. What now? Now. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could just be sometimes like the people that are happy to stay in those towns. Mm. But I also wouldn't change it. I like knowing how the world works. Mm. I like having seen the world. I like understanding the possibilities as a human how much we can do, yeah. the incredible nature of our brain, mm. how we can think something and make it real. Anything, anything is possible. Everything you see around us, anyone listening to this podcast right now is touching a table or a chair or looking at a mm. wall, it's all been created by a human yeah. from their mind. And so I think when I grew up in a typical town in England, no one told me that was possible. People told me that memorize, and if you memorize and get an A, then you're smart. Yep. If you don't, there's something wrong with you. We're going to put you in a special class. Because yep. I was dyslexic. Mm. So actually, I just thought that was normal. I'm a little bit stupid. It's kind of how they used to talk to me at school. I'm not stupid, it turns out. I just couldn't read because mm. I'm dyslexic. Mm. Very big difference. But yeah, growing up in a, in a small town, at that time, I didn't know it was a small town. And I thought that I was one of the lucky ones because we lived in a nice big house. Um, and it wasn't until recently I, I Googled the house we lived in. And if you'd asked me, I would have said, it's a five million pound house. Mm. I Googled it. It's a 400,000 pound house. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that's a small amount of money, but it's not what my childhood memory mm. is. It's this big fancy house. But my father uh, had his own business. And so I do remember as a kid uh, getting some exposure to entrepreneur life. Of course, my father was an entrepreneur. What was his business? He had an insurance brokerage. Mm. So, and and it was quite interesting if I review like what I'm doing to now to today is quite purposeful. And I think if I trace it back, you know, people don't realise how much you absorb from your parents. Absolutely. And my dad's whole thing—he wasn't selling life insurance. 
that that's not what he was doing. He was helping families be prepared for the day that something awful happened and they wouldn't have to worry about money at mm. least. And he he genuinely believed that. He used to know all of the customers he would sell to. He'd know their family history, their medical history. He would literally be there helping them understand how to set their lives up so if something awful happened to a family member, they mm. weren't stranded. And I remember when actually things did happen to his customers, how he was there for people. Mm. And so on the surface, he, you know, you could argue he was just a, a self-employed life insurance salesman, which doesn't sound very glamorous. Mm. But if I look back, he uh, he really cared about his customers. And, and, where, and where was it you said that you were homeless? How so, long were you homeless for? So sometimes I feel a bit of a fraud around this subject mm. because I was homeless for three weeks. Mm. And I talk to homeless people now that are homeless for six or seven years. I mean, they're institutionally homeless. I was temporarily homeless. I think that's probably a, a better classification. What were you, were rebelling against your parents? You do a runner? What, what so, went on? So for, it's my perspective. Yeah. So that so it, it might not be fair to say it's 100% the way it really was. Yeah. But uh, my father suddenly died of a heart attack at mm. 56. And I was 15 years old. And he died right in front of me. And I thought he was joking, mm. by the way. He, he was having a heart attack on the chair. I thought he was joking. Um, he was in the middle of an argument with my mum. And... And and then next thing you know, uh, he is having a heart attack. We all realise he's having a heart attack. We call the ambulance. The ambulance arrives too late and he dies. And then a combination of, I guess, uh, that's that situation, that emotional situation alongside, I didn't want to go home after that. So I go out to see friends. I didn't want to go home. Everyone, it was really miserable in my house. Um, non-stop crying, as you'd expect. My mum, of course, probably feeling guilty about having an argument with my dad and him dying alongside uh, her own loss of losing her husband. I'd lost my dad. Mm. So I just wanted to have fun. And I basically didn't come back until late. I certainly wasn't. I didn't smoke. I didn't do anything. I didn't drink. But you weren't living on the streets homeless. You were at mates' houses. And no, stuff, I, I, I um, three weeks after that lifestyle, well, I wasn't going back on time and my mum was frustrated. She gave that typical parent ultimatum. She said, it's my way or the highway. Yeah. And she and she kicked me out. And and, she, and I thought she was joking, but she chucked all my stuff out into the street and said, if you're not doing, you're not doing what I tell you to do, you're out. Mm. So that I literally grabbed a, a bag and some cloves and just kind of basically I moved into the, the, the playground down the road. And I slept on a roundabout for the first night and then I found a, 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 a staircase, funnily enough, mm. a place where I could actually hide and, from the rain. And, and slowly but surely, I started to try to figure out, you know, I actually hang out with homeless people for a while, which is pretty scary for a 15 year old. Yeah. I mean, these are most of the people that were institutionally homeless. But I went to Cambridge. I got, managed to get a free bus to Cambridge. That's where a lot of the homeless people were actually finding shelter. And I learned about the pay 15 quid and get somewhere to stay model that was off on offer. And anyway, long story short, eventually, somehow for a family friend, my uh, my mum actually had a family friend who owned kind of a squat. It's probably the best way to put it. It was a, they now call them homes with multiple occupancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like six bedrooms in a house. All six bedrooms were taken up, but there was a, there was a closet a, uh, where you keep all the brooms and mm. stuff. And basically said I could have that room. So I moved into this squat. Uh, it did feel like a squat to me at the time, but it was a broom cupboard. And again, I think my mum maybe thought that I was in a buckle break and just, you know, do whatever she said and move back home. But I just, my mum is a narcissist, I now know, looking okay. back in hindsight. I was just about to um, ask that question. What yeah. was your relationship like with your mum? Yeah, she's still alive, so she might be okay. listening to this podcast. She'll yeah. certainly have probably a different view. Yeah. But, um, you know, I now know what a narcissist looks like. I didn't as a kid. How do we know as a kid? We don't know what a narcissist well, looks like. We just only come, a, narcissist words only come about in the last two, three years when people right. start to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. but she, she, she is. Yeah. Um, and I don't find it easy to talk about, if mm. I'm being honest, because I, I don't like to say anything negative about someone. But um, I think equally, there'll be a lot of people listening. You just don't get on with your mum. Yeah. You, no, you just have to accept it. I've always craved having a, a mum that I could get on with. But she was controlling and she wanted it her way or the highway. And I just rejected it. I think at that moment, I, I became a man, maybe. Yeah. You know, I just grew up. Yeah. And and what was really interesting is um, I, I couldn't, of course, get a job because I didn't have a permanent address. On top of that, at 15 years old, I didn't have a national insurance card. So I also couldn't get a job because I didn't have an address and I didn't have a national insurance card. So I couldn't get a job. But I, um, yeah, so I actually had to 
uh, become an entrepreneur. Mm. I didn't even know the word entrepreneur. I think entrepreneur wasn't no, really a word back none then. Of us, none of us knew what entrepreneur was. My, my exact terminology was <laughs> yeah. I have to generate some money. Yeah. I guess we call it entrepreneurship now. Mm. But I um, I remember in, being in Cambridge thinking, I can't live like this. This is a nightmare. Um, I've got to get out from under. And walking past a big house in Cambridge and seeing a messy garden and thinking, and, and this is the first time this muscle woke up in my head, this entrepreneur muscle woke up in my head. Everyone's got this muscle. Mm. You just need to wake it up. Mm. Everyone's got it. I don't care. Introvert, extrovert, clever, not clever. Mm. You've got it there. You've definitely got this muscle. And it woke up in my brain through sheer desperation. And I said to myself, if you've got a big house and you've got a messy garden, maybe you don't have time to take care of your garden. And I just rocked up to the front door in sheer desperation, knocked on the door and said, hi, my name's Simon Squibb. I've got a gardening company. I'm wondering if I could take care of your garden. And the person standing at the door said, sure, funnily enough, I've been so busy. I've not had time to mm. find someone. Sure, let's give it a go. How much do you charge? And I picked a number out of the air. Mm. I just said, 200 pounds a month. And they went, sure, let's give it a go. And I remember walking back down the drive and all the things that go through your head, like, I don't have the equipment. Yeah. Uh, how am I going to do this? And I thought, well, do you know what? I'm just going to keep knocking on doors now and find out how many mm. other gardens I can get. And that's what I did. How did you get to Hong Kong? So Hong Kong is an interesting one. You're um, 23, right? 23, yeah. Okay. So um, I... So we're, we're, we're talking, what, year two, nine, late 90s? 1997. Seven, okay. So Hong Kong is about to get Did you go handed. down the uni, uni route or no, something like that? No, uni for me is a complete scam. Yeah. I, I think for 99.9% .9 of people, Agree. uni is a waste of time. I literally just interviewed a marketing person who spent four years marketing degree, yeah. £50,000 worth of debt. Yeah. And they asked them, what are the four ways you make money on TikTok? Mm -hmm. Couldn't tell me. Yeah. How can you be in marketing and not how something like TikTok yeah. works? But they've been taught what happened in 1999 when the dot-com yeah. bust happened and what you can learn from it. I mean, like, what a load it's of painful, bullshit. It's painful, isn't it? I agree with you. Yeah. I think it's a rip-off too. It is a, it's you crazy. You think you're going there, 50 grand's worth of debt, £27,000 you're paying for a lecture to teach you yeah. something that he's reading from a book written 25 years ago. Yeah. He's, and he's meant to be in marketing. If he was in marketing, he'd be in marketing. If he's, if you're someone teaching business, they'd be in business, not someone who's just yeah. regurgitating. Right. And you learn by doing. Yeah. You know, like, I think the problem is, and I and I, I complain a lot about the education system being broken, mm. and I also think it is designed to be broken. And I have, you know, strong beliefs around that. Yeah. A lot of people won't agree with me. But the point is that this the way the university system has now become structured. I mean, when I was young, mm. when I was in my 20s. It was free. Not only was it grand, not yeah. only was it free, mm. it wasn't the only way to get a job. Now everybody says, I mean, the whole line Tesla couldn't get a job at Tesla. Yeah, you know, the, the real geniuses don't need to go to university to be a genius. And quite often, the problem is now, if you want to be anything, it feels like university is the only way. There's another problem I've noticed through my audience. I've discovered this is that a lot of people don't know what they want to do because they haven't been given the tools to think about what they could be doing. So they go to university as a default. So I don't know what I want to do, but I love the idea of moving out of home. I've got three years freedom. buffer. So I've got three or four years Get to think about it. Play some sport, meet yeah. some friends, yes. some, and live in yeah. a house. and learn, and Which is a learn great pay, theory. And learn to pay my bills. Yes. But you're going to have 50 grand's worth of debt. But you're not taught that you're going to have 50 grand's worth of debt. No, you're not you're taught not about taught money at all. until the age of 65, you're going to be paying back that every single month coming out of your pay packet. Yeah, it's worse than that. Yeah. They're also then, like, for example, let's take a profession that people think is respected, right? I know someone that, trained to be a, you know went to university to become a lawyer mm. because you can't become a lawyer unless you go to university yeah. which in itself by the way is a problem yeah that's not should not be the way it is but university is the only right of passage to do certain jobs which is a complete monopoly on people's lives so what, account, what accountancy vets lawyers there's yeah. about three or four you think well, doctors of course doctors yeah. go to yeah. uni understand yeah. Yeah. But all the other three thousand ologies and whatever it's not worth the papers no, written on these days. definitely marketing yeah forget definitely. it and you know, events. just start posting on TikTok. And events degrees. Events degrees. Events I mean, degrees. I'm looking at them coming in here. A 21-year-old has done an events degree. Yeah. Uh, people aren't going to believe me. Yeah. But I can predict the future, right? And one thing I'm telling people right now, even if you're going to university to be a doctor, when you come out, let's say you go in today, it's an eight-year process, yeah. right? When you come out eight years from now, you're not going to be a doctor. Yeah. You know what you're going to do? You're going to be working for a company that does AI, AI doctors. AI to doctors, yeah. Yeah. So, you, so you're better off studying AI. Yeah. 
Because I, I guarantee there's... People say, oh, no way. Um, you can't replace the, the relationship with a GP. GPs are seeing 50 people a day. Yeah. You think they've got time to be empathetic yeah. and give you time? Yeah. They're making mistakes left, right and centre. Yeah. Do people go to a hospital today and say, right, we've got, uh, we'll give you an MRI, but we can get a human to check you as well. That's what we used to do, <laughs> a human. And it'll be really gentle with you and it'll be empathetic. Do you want the doctor or do you want the MRI machine that absolutely guarantees we're going to discover what's wrong with you? Yeah. Oh, I have the doctor, please. Yeah. That's what's going to change, yeah. right? And I so, think are you saying it's best for these young, young youngsters now coming through to learn AI, than rather going to doing a degree? I'm going to be even more woo woo than on. that. I think people need to learn about themselves. Mm. They need to look inward more. They need to discover what's going to bring them purpose. There's an experiment, and I always forget the name of it. Analog Twenty Five, I think it's called. And basically, this is going to sound negative, right, when I describe this this thing that's going to happen. But if we're prepared, it won't be, right? I think this, people always say, oh, these technologies have come along before and we've adapted. Yeah, but we, we've somewhat planned for it, right? We still have the Rust Belt, mind you. We still have devastation in economic structures where then those people vote for Trump, which is a nightmare. Yeah. Right. So so let's not pretend that technology's come along and we've totally adapted to it and everything's been fine. And AI is like, you know, the Rust Belt 10 x You know, doctors are going to lose their jobs. Lawyers are going to lose their jobs. Graphic designers are going to lose their jobs. These are jobs we thought were safe. They're not safe. I've been saying it for years. They're not safe. And my thing is about helping people realize their potential, believe in themselves, wake up that part on their brain that AI doesn't have, yeah. the ability to make something, you program your own self to make something happen. Mm. AI, which is amazing, still requires at the moment a prompt, right? So the only thing we have over that AI is the thing I was talking about earlier, the ability to think about something in our mind and make it real. We are our own prompt. Just explain your view on AI. How would you explain AI? Because it's been touted around there since, what, the last 9, 10, 11 months, AI, chat, GBT, etc. Can you explain to me what AI is? So first of all, I'm not an AI expert. No. But I will but tell you. But just in your I will, view. Yes, you know? I, but no one is. Yeah. This is the truth. It's too early for anyone to be an expert, right? Anybody, if you look at uh, all the people that are pioneering OpenAI and Sam Altman and even Elon Musk with his own new AI system, they're all basically saying the same. And the basic gist is AI is either the best thing that's ever happened to humanity or we're all going to get wiped out by a machine that realizes you want to save the planet, yep. the machine reframes it. Yep. The machine does not say save the planet, right? The machine says the planet will be fine without humans. We're saving humans when we're mm. talking about saving the planet. Let's mm. be honest. No one's framing it that way because it doesn't sound as cool. Mm. Saving the humans. Okay. Let's say saving the planet. That'll get us funding. Yeah. Right. The planet will be fine when we're gone. Yeah. And if AI figures that out, why wouldn't they just remove the thing that's destroying the planet? Right. On the positive side, and I do lean towards positive. I'm an optimistic mm. person. AI should relieve the human race of the slavery that they are locked into. What a line that is, Simon. AI should relieve the human race of the slavery that they're locked into. Wow, just think of that. But that's powerful. To free the slaves, yeah. we first need to recognize that people are slaves. Mm. But, so, people, but, but people in the UK working in jobs they do not like don't realize they're slaves. So, so, so there's a problem today and there's a problem tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, the problem today is that People do recognise they don't enjoy their jobs. There was a survey done recently by some bullshit newspaper yeah. saying 76% of people don't like their yeah. job. Okay, so we know that. By the way, 50% of stats are made up, so let's just be careful with yeah. stats. But, yeah. but it's how they ask the question. Mm. They get all this information. Mm. But that aside, I think that the truth is, yesterday morning, a delivery driver brought my food to me. Right. We all now love the idea of our food getting delivered to. In fact, there's been billions poured into companies that deliver your food to you. Right. Not billions into saving the planet, billions into a guy delivering on his motorbike your food to you. So you get it five minutes quicker. Right. Which is ridiculous mm. where to put your money. You know, if you would put resources into mm. getting your food to you quicker, billions has been spent on that. Putting that aside, the truth is when that delivery driver came yesterday to deliver my food, what I wanted to say to him was, what is your dream? Because 
It's not because I think he should become an entrepreneur because not everybody should. I just want everyone to be able to. That's where people misunderstand yeah. me in my yeah, content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want everyone to have the option to because right now they don't have the option. They're not given the tools at school. And most people that are entrepreneurs, although very generous, a lot of entrepreneurs, they do want workers. They want people to work for them. Why would you educate your workforce to understand how equity works? Or Everyone should own equity, right? We all know that as entrepreneurs, but we don't want our staff necessarily to know that because then they're going to ask us for equity and then what? We have less equity, right? But everyone should own equity. And what I wanted to say to that delivery driver yesterday was, your vehicle in five years' time will be delivered. This will be a robot doing this delivery. Mm. You will, you're, you're not, you're not going to have a job in five years' time. Mm. So let's sit down. Come on in. Um, thanks for delivering my food. Come on in. Let's sit down and figure out five years from now what you're going to do. And no one wants to tell him that. You know why? Because we need that delivery driver for the next five years. Yeah. They, they want to hold back telling him to the day they no longer do. Uber's biggest investment right now is in automated vehicles. Mm. So do Uber care about their drivers? Well, that's what they say right now. Mm. Of course they care about their drivers. Do you believe that Uber will be completely automated? Be completely automated. So Uber today, they have to pretend they care about their drivers, right? I promise you they don't. You only need to look at what these companies are investing in to understand what they really care about. They care about automating that. They don't want the drivers. They're a pain. Mm. They've got the last mile. They've got the client relationship. The most important thing in any business is to own the last mile, which is why I hate Amazon FBA and all that rubbish, mm. right? If you don't own the last mile, you don't own the relationship with the client. Uber own the relationship with the client. It's their app, their details. They've got your bank details. They've got your relationship. They want to remove the driver as soon as possible. Now, you could argue that this is capitalistic evil. No, it's just progression. Mm. It's just, I don't blame Uber for that. Are you scared that. by this progression, the speed that everything's happening right now? I'm scared if we don't prepare. Mm. I'm scared if we don't talk about it. I'm scared if every time it gets brought up, it suddenly becomes a conspiracy theory and people try to box it away. And why does it get put into conspiracy theory bracket? Because let's face it, if Rishi Sunak stood up at his conference recently and said, right, delivery drivers, listen, I care about you and I want you to vote for me. I'm going to let you into a secret. I know that cars are going to drive themselves within five years. They all know it. <laughs> yeah. So let's help you find a new purpose. And then they say some shit about universal basic income, which pops up every so often to try and dampen this down. Universal basic income. So universal basic income is the only answer people seem to have to the point I'm making, which is let's say AI and automation takes all of these jobs, right? Let's say it takes all of the jobs, the shelf stacking jobs, all the way up to a doctor. Let's say it takes them all. And the answer that everyone throws around, which is frankly weak, shallow answer, is universal basic income, which is basically a glamorized version of social credit. Mm. So in England, 2.3 million people claim some sort of benefit, right? 2.3 million people. Is it 2.3 million? Imagine. Oh my God. Um, Imagine if AI takes over and that will end up being what? 10, 15, well, 20. It will be everybody. Yeah. Now, there's good and bad to mm. that. The good is there should be an abundance of everything, mm. right? For much less cost. There should be an abundance of food. The harvesting system should be better. And generally, we should have abundance. And Naval talks about this. Mm. Uh, and so I don't want to steal his content, mm. but I'm inspired by some of the things he says. I am aligned with a lot of the things he said. I've got some things to add to what yeah. he said. But I think the key is the, we need to be universal basic income on its own. The theory is that money coming into your bank account will take away your worries, mm. right? It won't. And I have run this experiment on myself by going away, making a shitload of money and sitting down with all that money it doesn't make me happy. Mm. It's cheating. Now, people that don't have money, might people say, well, that's good for you to say, mate. It does take away worries mm. about getting food and stuff. But with AI and automation, if I'm thinking positively about it, it will take away the worry about food and drink. And this is where this social experiment came in and blew my mind. And I keep getting it wrong. I tell her 25. I'll check the name of it. Basically, what they did is they took uh, four rats and they put them in a beautiful enclosure. And in this enclosure... There was food and water and warmth and abundance. And initially they thrived. And those four, they added another colony and another colony and another colony. And basically, within 10 years, there was 20,000 rats in this colony. And then it was all harmonious. And then, boom, they started eating each other. And the conclusion to the experiment is... Just because you give people the basic human right needs of accommodation and food and water, they need purpose. Mm. The rat needs to feel like it's going out and hunting. There needs to be a tribal structure. 
Humans are no different. We're going to be overpopulated. We know that already. Right? So that's one concern. Elon Musk says there's another concern, and there is underpopulation. So there's always that equilibrium of encouraging. Po China's done this. One child policy. Oh, now you can have as many children as you want. So mm. there's, there's, they are, we are being managed, mm. right, in that regard. Right? And, and an educated society today, the stats show that more educated society have less kids. That's kind of good for some countries like Japan. That, uh, bad for countries like Japan that want more population, but good for countries like China that want less population. Mm. But the ultimate thing is, if we don't give people purpose. And so today, today's problem is a lot of people hate their job and they're mm. trapped by debt. They're trapped by literally they've got no time to breathe. Yep. They've just got to pay the bills and they're trapped by that. They don't have time to think about purpose. They don't even have time to think about a side hustle most mm. of the time. Right? Most of the things that they consume are how to save £100. Mm. Right? Everything is sold to them, how to save £100. It's not sold to you how to make £100. Mm. Right? So I think we need to initially give people that freedom to make £100, freedom to do something they love, back to what we're saying, fun. Long term, however, though, I think it's even more serious. If we are going to live in this positive AI world, which I'm hoping we will, we need a purpose. And that's why education around self-awareness is going to be required. That's why waking people up, pattern interruption, where people don't self-sabotage themselves. Everyone thinks sitting at home all day playing Xbox was fun until COVID came along. And we're like, actually, this isn't right. So why are people still craving retirement? Why have we not made the connection between the boredom we have during COVID and that slightly mental anxiety that we have doing nothing and retirement? Mm. We need to scrap retirement. Mm. Retirement doesn't exist. Mm. It's bullshit. It's pretty much designed 50 years ago to make you get a mortgage, pay that mortgage off with the day coming that you'll be free to do what you want. It is total rubbish. Yeah. I don't have a pension mm. and don't get a pension. It is mm. a scam. Live your life. Mm. Don't need to retire. Agree. It's funny, isn't it? When I think I don't know what the stats are, but when someone retires, the amount of life they've got left goes... Well, yeah. Well, as soon as you stop Because they're like, shit, what am I going to do with myself? But actually, if you've been in a job, a dead-end job that you have really not enjoyed and you've never had purpose for 40 years... What are you going to do apart from a bit of gardening, a bit of yeah. whatever for those next five, six, seven years before you pop it off? Yeah, people normally within two years, mm. depending on what survey you look it's at. Sad, isn't it? Within two years, people die from retirement. Imagine, imagine working all your life in a job you didn't enjoy. Well, the thing is, like, you could become you... immune to it. I think. I think the thing is, people see people don't know what they don't know, right? So when I talk about entrepreneurship, this is the sort of thing that comes up. People say, "Well, ninety percent of businesses fail in the first year." Now, thumbs up, like, share if you've heard this before. If you're listening to this. Have you heard this one? 90% of businesses mm. fell in the first year, right? You guys heard this? 90% of businesses mm. fell in the first year, yeah? It's a fucking lie. Mm. In the UK, 23% of businesses fail in the first year. 23%. Within three years, 64% yes, fail in the first year. Three years is 70%, isn't it? Yeah. But let's just break yeah. that down for a second. This is where the stats don't stack up, yeah. right? They're used to put people off living their dream. If you, I'm part of this stat. My first business failed. I still made money, right? Don't, don't link failure to not making money. I made money and then it failed. I learned a load of things that helped me have a better life and then it failed, right? That's why failure is good because I learned so much from that failure. But then when I started my second business, it's compound learning. So the second business lasted three years before it failed. So I'm part of that second stat. But what they don't tell you is if you go again, 80% of people f succeed, mm. right? So yes, you fail in the first year. Okay, let's say you're one of that low percentage that failed. You still made, made money. Mm. But let's say you failed. And you've learned a shed load. You've learned a shed. It's compound yeah. learning. Yeah. Right? Which people talk about compound interest all the time and not enough about compound learning. Mm. And so I love the fact that I failed. I failed so young that it allowed me to compound and compound and compound. So by the time I got to 40, I was so fucking knowledgeable. There's there's no <laughs> business I can't start. Yeah. There's there's no vision you could give me that I couldn't make happen. Mm. That's why when I stop people in the street, they tell me their crazy idea. There's no idea. You can't make happen mm. once you know what I know. So what did you, what made you go to Hong Kong? What made you go, I'm going to Hong Kong? So a combination of things. I, I love fate in life mm. um, and a combination of things. I think when you, when you um, grow up and I sometimes define my growing up as, you know, from that time that I left home, that's when I really grew up. Before mm. that, I was a kid, mm. right? But, you know, being homeless for a short period of time and then having to survive on your own, having no one to turn to to get help from, that really grew me up. I grew up in that moment. But I think um, when I got to 23, I finally made a business work. 
I'd made a bit of money and I actually had taken a few jobs here and there, which I didn't like, but I also learned about how businesses work. What sort of jobs? I worked in a hotel for a while um, and uh, I really loved it actually. And here's the interesting thing. Like I really believe in entrepreneurship and I believe everyone should be their own boss and at least have equity where they work, mm -hmm. right? I believe that of all my heart. But I also believe, and I've seen it myself, that when you get a job, sometimes good is the enemy of great, right? You, I had a job that was good. Hold on. When you get a job, good is the enemy of great. Yes, because you can have a job, and this is what happens. People say, well, they give me a bit of flexibility on the hours, mm. and you know, and, and I can go home and not have to think about it, and I like that. Mm. I'm like, well, do you know what the other side is like? No, but I quite like not having to worry about that. And I fell into that trap for a little yeah. bit. Part of me was like, I had, a, I, had, I had another business I was running, something called Accommodation Express, while I was working at the hotel. Mm. And a part of me was like, why am I bothering with this side hustle? I just enjoy it. Like, I'll go out with my mates on a Friday night, mm. I go, oh, weekends, meeting girls, having yeah. fun. Now, why am I doing this side hustle? Right. So I almost fell into it myself because one of my favorite movies is Shawshank Redemption. Mm. Right. And in that movie, about ruining it for anyone that hasn't listened to it, one of the things in that movie that really strikes a chord to explain what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's a guy that goes to prison for 50 years. Right. And when he's released and he's scared of the world and he doesn't want that world, he doesn't want a soft mattress. He wants the hard mattress in the prison. He doesn't want to go to McDonald's. He wants the crap food from the prison. He doesn't want to be free. He wants to hang out with his rat that he's his friend back in the prison. We get institutionalized very quickly. Humans adapt very quickly. It's actually one of our superpowers, but we can get also entrapped, mm. right? We, we basically believe what we've got isn't as bad as someone else. Mm. So we go along with it. And that's what happens to a lot of people. And there is another element to this that I've seen a lot of people. When they get responsibility, I mean, I don't know about you, but when my six-year-old came along, I definitely changed. Mm, my priorities changed. Same. And I think when people have kids, everything is about that kid, right? So a lot of people give up on their dreams for their kids. And you know what? That's admirable. But I would give one word of warning. The people I've seen that do that, and I know quite a few people have done that, they often end up breeding a child that thinks that's the way to live. So in other words, if someone says to me, they're not going to do what they love because they've got a mortgage to pay yeah. and they've got kids to look after, I always tell them, that's fine. Totally understand. You're doing it for your kid, are you? Yeah, I'm doing it for my kid. I'm like, just remember, your kid is going to grow up thinking the way that you're living is the way they must live. Yeah. They're going to repeat history. Yeah. Even if you leave them this house, inheritance tax is going to take half. If you've got two kids, it's going to drop 25% each. They're going to have to get a mortgage to buy the very house you're living in right now. They're going to repeat history. Yeah. There is the odd exception where they might realize they don't want your life and try to break free, but you won't have the tools to help them. So if you really want to help them, do what you love. Mm. They won't care you've got less money. They'll see that you're happy. My son asks me if I'm happy sometimes. I always tell him the truth mm. because they know. So if you tell your kid, I'm doing this, they'll hear you talking to your wife or your wife talking yeah. to your husband. I'm doing this to pay the bills. I'm doing this job I hate to help you guys all get mm. food on the table. That kid is hearing mm. that. That's dripping to their subconscious. They're going to copy you. They're going to live the same life as you. Is that what you want? Very true. Hong Kong. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hong Kong is the second awakening for me, yeah. that experience. Um, I think waking up that part of my brain when I was 15 was the first awakening. And then Hong Kong was the second. Mm. And originally I went there because in reality, I had a friend who had moved out there and he said, you can stay on my couch. Mm. And I thought, well, and I, I'd actually just had a business succeed and sold it for a little bit of money. And I thought, and I was, I was still actually working at the hotel. And I thought, I'll try it, I'll go. And I remember the day I went and spoke to the boss who ran the hotel, who, who was a friend, and said, look, I'm leaving, I've sold my little business and I'm gonna go to Hong Kong. He said, Simon, you don't wanna go to Hong Kong. I'm like, why? He's like, triads, mm. uh, a lot of drugs out there as well. I'm like, oh, really? Mm. And I hate drugs, mm. I'm scared of all that stuff. I was like, oh, it put me off a little bit. I'm like, oh, maybe maybe I won't go. And then I did go. And it's interesting. He, lovely person, he actually didn't know Hong Kong, but he tried to plant a seed. So someone I respected gave me advice that was wrong. Mm. This is very dangerous this in people's eyes. This is very science, dangerous. In right? Yeah. So a lot of people will throw out an opinion without knowing. I should have asked him, and I wasn't mature enough to understand this at the mm. time. I should have asked him, how long have you lived in Hong Kong mm. then? 
What, what did you do in Hong Kong to have this advice you've just given me? That is, And in reality, he had an alternative motive. He wanted to keep me mm. at the hotel. A good person. He might be listening to this podcast. I like him. But he didn't do it on purpose. Mm. But people do manipulate. What's his name? I don't want to say. Glenn Burrell. <laughs> there you go. But he is a nice person. Yep. Um, and he just, you know, he was saying it in part because that's what he knew. So someone had probably told him the same bullshit. At the same time, he wanted to keep me there. Yep. So he thought, if I say that, maybe Simon won't leave or he'll come back. And he actually said, Simon, you're going to go there. You won't like it. I'll keep I'll keep this job open for you. Which is an amazing thing for a boss to do, isn't it? Mm. Like, actually, go back to my good is the enemy of great. Mm. That job was nice. Mm. He was nice. I had I had a swimming pool to swim in. I had free food all the time. I was living in the hotel. Like, life was not bad compared to, compared to being homeless. Right? But it wasn't great. It wasn't a great life. And I knew it. So when I got that opportunity to go out to Hong Kong, I went for it. And when I got out there, I remember the first night I was in Hong Kong, I'd heard all these things about Hong Kong as a city, you know, like it's concrete jungle, mm. you know, pictures of the skyline. I'm sure people have heard about it. Communism city mm. next to China, communism, right? So all these preconceptions that I had. And when I got there and sat sat on the harbour front and, and I started talking to people, I realised all that was propaganda. Mm. The humans that live there, yeah. that eat three meals a day, and consume fr and, and care about their kids. Mm. And it turns out they're exactly the fucking same as us, yep. despite what the media told me. The fact that it was a linked to a communist country had no relevance on the human beings living there. But that's all we hear, isn't it? Mm. China's communism, China's bad, China's this, yeah. China's that. It's like brainwashing yeah. headlines that make us believe, these subconscious beliefs mm. are all over the place. Like the 90% of businesses fail in the first mm. year, or the harder you work, the luckier you get. All this subconscious bullshit that's put into our minds becomes reality. We believe it to be true, and it's not. And Hong Kong woke me up to that fact. What business did you set up in Hong Kong? Fluid. Yes. What was Fluid? So Fluid initially, um, the best way I can describe it was, I met a beautiful lady who was a graphic designer, and I just fancied her, uh, which nowadays you're not allowed to name, say, I think. Name? Helen Griffiths. Helen Griffiths. Shout Absol out to Helen. Yeah, shout out to Helen. <laughs> Absolutely fancied her back then. Mm. So if she's listening, back then I fancied her. Um, and, um, and you know, she, she was a real talent. And I just, she was a friend of the person whose couch I was sleeping on, right? Um, and, um, and basically I just said to her, oh, you know, I had some money I'd just made, right, uh, from from my business. I was like, oh, I'll fund you to start your business. Probably my first kind of angel investment pitch. Without realising. Without realising yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah. it was just because I wanted to hang out with yeah. her. And I did think she was super talented, mm. just for the record. Um, and she said, oh, you know, okay. So I bought her a computer, which I think at the time, you know, it was quite a lot of money for me. Computers were really expensive back in those days. Mm. And I bought some software for her. And, uh, and and then basically we sat down and we started brainstorming ideas for her business. And she said, I hate doing all the sales stuff, Simon. Can you do it? And I'm like, okay, I'll help you out. Mm. And then we there and then came up with a name. We had two names. One was called Pink Tank, thinking Pink Think Tank. Yeah. And the other was Fluid. Yeah. I just cannot see PwC, the largest accounts company in the world, buying Pink Tank. Pink tank yeah. So I'm glad we went uh, with Fluid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so we went with Fluid and um, and 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 the rest is history. I, I made every mistake there is in the book again uh, because and I... And what was Fluid? So Fluid was primarily a creative agency, but okay. we, we kind of had an edge. If people are familiar with the creative agency space, our direct competitor eventually would be... Um, trying to think of the uh the big brand name it suddenly slipped my mind um we compete with olga v and leo burnett and uh the the, the main competitor i was targeting in the end was mckinsey mm. so it's basically strategy you think of a problem that a brand has a client has and you solve it for them and then through creative yeah you you bring them so for example we would go cnn would say to us back in the day we want to get more people watching cnn but they see it as an american tv yeah. show you know, American news. Yeah. We're like, well, why don't you get into all the hotels? Why don't you go into all the hotels internationally and be the TV channel for news in the hotels? And that changed CNN, mm. that, that type of idea, right? Suddenly CNN, when you when you go overseas, you, you uh, if people from America go overseas, they can get something American, CNN. But also as a non-American, I was suddenly watching CNN to get the news mm. when I would stay in a hotel mm. in Asia. Right. So it would strategy like that. And then we'd help them implement things, the marketing for that new 
strategy. And we would get paid for the idea and we get paid for the execution. And we were the first company to do both. We also were the first company in, in that time to do digital. So we were, we did a one of the first United Airlines digital campaigns. We built them a micro site. People not even know. We built them a little website to run a competition. Are we, we talking? Where are we talking? It early two thousand. So this now. is 2000, 2000, 2001 at and this point. You were, and how long were you in Hong Kong for? Twenty one years. So you were there for twenty one years building yes. this business, and then you exited the business after yeah. twenty one years. Fifteen years to build the business, yep. and eleven years running it myself. Yep. And then I wised up that I wasn't the best person to keep running it. Yep. And a lot of people get trapped by and their own business. it's easier to take yourself out of the business, business to guide it and what have yeah. you for easy for the sale. It's actually, the easiest, it's the yeah. hardest thing in the world to take yourself out of the business. Yeah. That's what a lot of people in England, well, cause they're too sole traders. Too emotionally attached to it. Well, they're too emotionally attached to it. They built a business that totally relies on their skill set. Yeah. So they, they, they become, most people that start businesses start off as generalists. Yeah. What you want to become is a specialist, yeah. right? So specialism is like, probably where you're at today you mm. you have an eye you have a management style mm. you become a specialist i was a generalist yep. as an entrepreneur when i was younger now i'm a specialist and a generalist which is kind of the ultimate yep. i'm a, i'm a specialist in marketing yeah there is nothing i don't understand about marketing mm. and i've learned that over 30 years of doing business but i wasn't in the beginning mm. but what i did notice and reason when i teamed up with helen to do fluid we had great complementary skills. Mm. Helen was great at creative and I was great at coming up with ideas. On she the was good side. looking. She was good looking. <laughs> and so was I back then for anybody that didn't, uh, you know, maybe I can, I was, I was, you know, I was all right. Um, but I, um, but we built that business together. We made mistake, every mistake there is yeah. in the book. Everyone that will tell you not to do. We, we were in a relationship, building a business together when you're in a relationship. A lot mm. of people say, don't do that. Mm. I loved it. Mm. I think working with someone um, it's like when you move in with someone. If anyone's moved in with someone, you're like, you suddenly, they can't hide who they are yeah, so much. You yeah, see yeah, yeah. Their, their frustrations, who they really are. Working with someone's another level again. Yeah. Like I really, really loved working with Helen. I really found out who she was. I remember in 2003, we had SARS in Hong Kong, which was COVID yeah. 1.0, by the way. People don't realize we had COVID, mm. a form of COVID already in Hong Kong in 2003. And we, uh, we suffered as a business. We were doing really well, nonstop growth. And then 2003 came, one of our biggest clients uh, almost went bankrupt. Um, and so we were financially in a bit of trouble. And I remember going to Helen and saying, Helen, um, we've only got enough money in the bank to you know, either pay us and our bills um, or pay our staff. Mm. And Helen, without blinking, said, we have to pay our people first. Mm. Simon. We have to pay them. Brilliant. That's our responsibility. Brilliant. And I, I went to her with the option. Mm. I, I was conflicted. Yeah. You know, like, and she was the well, right. you were conflicted whether to pay yourselves first or the staff Well, because, you know, the whole, a lot, a lot of things, you know, a lot of sayings out there saying a lot of shit. But one of the things that sometimes is true, you've got to fill your own bucket first. Mm. Right. If, if we don't pay our bills, then we can't operate the business. Mm. Now, if our staff quit, we could probably still operate. Right. So there's that, that that's called that business structural mercenary approach or there's the do the right thing approach. Mm. And Helen was always on the side of do the right thing. Mm. Always. And she made me a better person yeah. for it, too. That's because not, that's a lovely compliment. Yeah. So and and, and I think that's the thing as well, isn't it? And partner, the right partner. I yeah. think uh, the biggest mm. deal I've ever done had no contract, no terms, mm. no deal, Same. no forward projection yeah. on what we do to help you. Look at the eye. No give without no yeah. give and take mm. no guarantee of give and take mm. none of it partner your partner in life whatever that, that takes form for you is so important yeah. helen made me a better person mm. she, because i came from a point of like survival mm. 15 years old having to survive and during that process you lose some of what who you are mm. right I, I genuinely think and this might be you know odd for someone to say about themselves but i'm a good person yeah i am but along the way, you're when you're... You know what I, I, I take from it, so like, I think you're a really kind, warm-hearted person. I think along the way, in my early years... But that's been I triggered. It, it wasn't in your Well, life. I had no choice but to survive. Yeah. So, and I learned from people that perhaps weren't scrupulous. Yeah. You know, some people would say, oh, you know, that gardening company over there is trying to take your business. And they'd be like, oh, why? We're going to fight the competitive yeah. nature. Yeah. And a part of me would be like, well, should we steal their lawnmowers? They, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, yeah. you come up with crazy ideas yeah. that aren't me. Yeah. But, you know, in if, your you, 20s, if though, you don't have the right guidance, yeah. Yeah. if you don't have the right people around you. And at 23 years old, two things happened. Hong Kong woke my mind up to what the world is really like. And I didn't need to believe the media all the time. Mm. And two, I met Helen. Mm. And Helen was. Did you have a relationship with her? So yeah, we did yeah. Um, for for a while. 
Um, and then one day, um, Helen came to me and she said, Simon, I'm turning 30 next week. And how old were um, you at the time? I'm 33 at this point. Okay. And she said, um, we've been working together now, you know, seven, eight years. Um, marry me or I'm leaving you. <laughs> Quality, is that what yeah. she said? Yeah. So, um, and it's really weird. And I, I don't know, you know, with, with women listening or, you know, whether this is true universally, but this is certainly true for me. Um, you know, I wasn't thinking about marriage. I was thinking about providing. Mm. I was thinking about providing for her because I loved her. And I was thinking about building my legacy, you know, and never going back to 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 the life I had before. Mm. Um, and so when she said that to me, it was like a pattern interrupt, right? Because I'm like, well, aren't you happy? She's like, yeah, I'm happy. I'm like, so why do we need to change anything? Mm. And, and, and I think in that moment, she taught me another lesson, which is it's not always about what I want. Right. Sometimes you've got to have a life that's happy. You've got to also think about what other people want. And I said, of course, I marry you. Best thing I ever did. I didn't know I needed it. And we're married today. We've got a six year old. Oh, so quality. it worked out. I was expecting you to say. I know. I was, I was, I was deliberately like, playing was it that like, way for you. Oh, yeah. We're married for a year and a half. We split up. We've split 50 50 no. business. No, OK. Together, oh, 21, 21 plus years now. And we've oh, got a little boy to to together. Helen. Yeah. And um, so it wasn't a me too. I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't seduce her to uh, be with me because I invested in her business. It was literally, you know, true love. So. How did you build that business? You said you were building that business for 15 years. How many members of staff at your peak were you at? So at, at the, well, the two questions, different questions mm. there. At the peak of the business, yep. I would say peak being we were our most efficient and most profitable. Okay. We were 60 full-time people yep. and 200 people on contracts and partnership okay. arrangements. Okay. Um, but at my size peak, we had 150 people on payroll. Yeah. Uh, but that wasn't the most efficient. No, time. never. Is, it was is the it? biggest yeah. time. So people would walk in, like, oh my god, yeah. you got so many people. Yeah. But it's a bit like a restaurant. A restaurant could be full up, but failing. Agree. And I think that's sometimes something people don't realize in business. And I and I, I'd rather have a restaurant that wasn't full up but was succeeding. Mm. Um, so yeah. And did you love your time in Hong Kong? In short, yes. Okay. Uh, I think when you review anything. It, there's always going to be highs and lows. When I first went to Hong Kong, I didn't enjoy it. Mm. I was quite lonely. It's a very different place, isn't it? It's a very different mm. place. I, uh, And I guess this is where I also grew up a bit. Again, I grew up another level because when I went there, and this is the example, so, someone I, w I was trying to get some business and someone said to me, oh, come on to um, my yacht on Sunday and we'll talk business. And I was just thinking, I just want to relax on Sunday. Mm. I was still in the Monday to Friday mentality, even though I was self-employed. It was still like, I need a day off. Yeah. You know, in my mind, that's the conditioning I've got. Mm. I need a day off. Even though I'm self-employed, right? So it hasn't completely woken me up. I need that day off, right? What were you chasing? Were you chasing the pound note? No, were never. You, you never? I have what? never chased the money, never. But were you chasing the money? Did you have a uh, saying, I'm going to build this business to sell one day? No. Or was it later on you're thinking, hold on, I've actually got something that people would want to buy here? Yeah, no, I never built it to sell it. In fact, I tell people when they pitch to me to invest, if someone says to me, I'm going to build it and sell it, like I said to you earlier, mistake. Do mm. not build a business to sell it. Do not do that. So what um, point did, What point in those 15 years you said, I'm going to sell it then? Uh, so there was a couple of moments. Basically, selling it was also luck. And, and I think the best way to sell a company is not want to sell it. Agree. It's the best time to yeah, sell it. Yeah, because you can negotiate yeah. a very good deal Absolutely. if you don't want to sell it. Who did you meet to create that luck? So a combination of experience and grit. A lot of companies in, in, the, in the 15 years that I ran that company, in that, in that whole cycle, the first few years, I was not the best person to run the business, but it was I was the only person that could make it come alive. Mm. But I didn't have the experience or knowledge to run an agency. But I got really good at it. And for the next five or six years, I was probably the best in the business because we were growing and I was good at building culture. I was good at getting brands on board. I was good at building teams, right? And then it got to a point, maybe year seven or eight, and there's actually a thing called the seven and eights, yep. right? Then you've heard of this management technique mm -hmm. called the seven and eights. But anyway, there's a there's a year seven, year eight, where I was no longer the best, yep. but I was ingrained in the business. Yep. So I was the salesperson, right? Everybody else I hired was pretty much a creative, yep. okay? Because the creative execution was important. Yep. We had some strategists, some thinkers, but I was the only salesperson really in that organization. And so I made myself the center of it all and I loved it. I was on stage in Hong Kong. People were talking about my business all the time. I lapped it all up and the business was successful. And then one day, Helen again, 
She came to me about 10 years into the business and she said, Simon, I'm no longer enjoying this business. I'm like, what are you talking about? We built up this incredible company. You remember Mark and Chantel? We're bigger than them. We're more successful than them. Remember when we sat down and said, that would be our dream to be like them. We've done it. We're here. She's like, yeah, I just don't enjoy it anymore. Mm. I couldn't comprehend it. Mm. And I think, you know, a parallel might be, and this, again, this is hopefully not taken the wrong way, but, you know, we used to wake up in the morning and not have a fridge. We used to wake up in the morning and go out and hunt. And the way I work, and I think a lot of men work, and women too, we wake up and we say, right, it's raining outside, it's a blizzard, it's cold. I've still got to go out and hunt. Mm. And we actually get out there and enjoy the blizzard. We enjoy the challenge, right? And we embrace life. We're out there fighting. We're hunting for food. And I was in that mode. Mm. I didn't have the luxury of thinking, did I like it or not? Yeah. I woke up every day and had to feed yeah. that animal that I'd built. I had to get sales. I had to build that business. Yeah. It couldn't stop. And I knew already because I had a year where we had all this brilliant business come in. Mm. And I thought, I don't need to sell anymore. Great, I can do something else. And then two of those clients went bankrupt. Yep. So I couldn't stop. Yep. And I'd learned that. So I turned on that hunt instinct every single day. And then when Helen said that to me, she patently interrupted me. And initially, I rejected it. I'm yep. like, you are mad. Yep. You're going to walk away from this. She's like, I just don't enjoy it. I love you. Did you I change? I, yeah, a leopard yeah. changes its spots. Yeah. That, that's like, that's like, like, I'm, like I'm, I'm hearing this. And when you're building a business with a partner, and mm. I've done the same with my beautiful wife over the last 20 years. When you're building a business with your partner here, sometimes that person is so hungry mm. that the other person is a bit like, can you just slow down? Yeah, of course. Well, we you need, need a yin yang. You, you, you're so hungry and trying to get out there and give it. Just slow down, will you? Because we need to be looking at this now. Mm. And it sounds like you were on that <coughs> charge, mm. and she was probably like, "Has he changed a bit? Mm. Do you think you changed? Do you think? Do you think Helen thought you changed? No. Um, I mean, we'd have to ask her. I will ask her tonight. Yeah. I don't think I did change. I think I just got better at what I did, and I think that I was, I wasn't more hungry than Helen. But I, my, my side of the business couldn't stop. That's what I mean. It's so sales. So we'd replaced Helen. Relationships reality. and sales. Yeah, right? you, that bit couldn't stop. Yeah, I agree. Um, and every time I made money, I put it into infrastructure. And infrastructure meant, you know, created people or nicer chairs. or yeah. I never actually replaced myself because I, I, I didn't see the need. And I would be expensive to replace. But also, when you're coming to sell a business, that's also very dangerous. Exactly. You being in. Totally. Like I run my business like an investorpreneur where I'm investing in, but I've got management and directors in place to totally. be running it. So this is, your question was, how did I sell the business? And yep. I'm building up to it because yep. you're exactly right. Mm. Exa 100% right. Now, what happened was, Helen said she's leaving. I was devastated at the time. Leaving you. Not leaving me, leaving the business. She, we were 50-50. Yeah. And she was no longer going to work in the business. So I'd gone from like 10 years of feeling like in every way, Helen worked harder than me in her own way. Yeah. She had her Creative. job. She didn't stop. She cared. She was my sounding board. I was hers. We, w we were in that war together on the front line every single day for 10 years. Yeah. And then one day, it's like your front line officer coming to you and saying, I don't want to fight in a war with you anymore. Yeah. I'm tired. Yeah. I'm like, no, what am I going to do? Mm. And then we went through a process where I got to understand what she wanted next. And I tried to put aside my worry for the business of her not being in it because all the creative people at that point looked up to her. She ran the creative team from an aspirational point of view. She's very talented. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to manage all these people. Yeah. I'm not a creative, yeah. right? So we went for a process and part of it was I learned to understand what her true needs were, mm. right? And what, her, what, meant, what freedom meant to her. She was trapped in her own business. Yeah. Right. Which a lot of people are. A lot of people are. Yeah. And 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 I was part partly doing that to her. Someone I loved, I trapped in the business because every single day I was like, I love this, we're doing so yeah. well. Thank you. Yeah. These these it's turned out to be accidental manipulation. I didn't know I was yeah. manipulated. I wasn't doing I didn't know she wanted to leave. Yeah. But she was trapped. Right. It took her a year to tell me, if I found out later. It took mm. her a year to tell me she was no longer wanting to do this business. A year. Mm. So long story short, I we found someone to replace Helen. And Helen got out. Helen learned a whole new thing called kinesiology, which is like a healing thing. Mm. She now heals people. Kinesiology. Kinesiology. Yeah, yeah. Okay, she, yeah. she heals people, yeah. which is frankly far, far more important than designing a logo for yeah. CNN, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she heals people. But I didn't see it that way at the time. 
uh, and she, she she's going to learn that and I, I love her for it. But I, I then felt a little bit initially lonely in the business because I no longer had that. Someone to bounce that, off. Exactly, yep. in the same way. She was still there, mm-hmm. but it wasn't the same. But I ran it for a few years like that. And then I had, it took me a few years to have the same epiphany that mm-hmm. Helen had, that actually I wasn't enjoying it. Mm-hmm. I was too busy in hunt mode and I wasn't in self-reflection mode. Yep. And it took two years to turn that on in me because I, I just couldn't i built something that was so successful why would i stop mm. it's taken me a long time to get to this point mm. i was in hong kong i was the number one creative agency in the region from scratch and i had the likes of estee lauder and cnn and all these big brands coming to us for help it was awesome at peak what sort of turnover were you doing um i don't think pwc will let me say it because they now own the business and i'm not sure they let me talk about it but it was tens of millions okay and um and at, at points, we were making a lot of money, but equally, I used to invest a lot of money back in the people. Yeah. And that was always my model. And this is a model I believe in, actually, by the way. You, people take profit too early from a business. Agreed. I kept putting money back Keep in. Keep pumping it back and in. And that was another reason. Like, yeah. we hadn't, on paper, we were potentially wealthy, yeah. me and Helen, but we weren't actually, we hadn't realized. Yeah. On paper, I was a millionaire. Yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. Multi-millionaire at that 30. Yeah. But in reality, cash in the bank, very different. Yeah. And if I stop sales... That means our payroll will be more than our income. And very quickly, within six months, go I'd bust. be bankrupt. Yeah. I'd go from on paper being a multimillionaire at 30 to being bankrupt if I took my foot off the pedal. That yeah. was my mindset. But, but multimillionaire at 30 on paper doesn't really mean much. Well, this is it. And a lot of people talk about this. Oh, multimillionaire, I've got this. It doesn't mean much. No, it doesn't mean much. It only mean much. means it when it's in your personal bank account. So you can go, ah, oh, exactly. I've made it. And there's a big, massive thing out there about what a millionaire is. Right. What's a millionaire in your world? Well, there's lots of definitions thrown mm. around around this. I mean, the, the textbook definition depends on who you talk to. Mm. But I think I mean, ultimately it is, I think the concept of a millionaire is a little bit misleading because inflation is. and value. And so a lot and of people say, like, I think Fortune magazine say, you've got to have the ability to lay your hands on a million pounds right now. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. But anyone that's actually got a million pounds would be dumb to just have it sitting in a bank account, mm. maybe until recently, right? Mm. So most people don't have that available to them. Um, and people say, well, you've got to take your house out of the equation. Mm. Well, I own my house outright. I don't want a mortgage. Mm. I could get a house twice as big. I could get a lot. I could I could get mortgage. Mm. I don't want any of that rubbish. Mm. So, but if you took my house out of my equation, would I be poorer? On paper, some people would argue yes. But to me, I'm richer because I kept my cost down. Yeah, I believe that's that's the I, key. Keeping I think, your monthly I think cost down. I agree. You shouldn't give a shit whether you're a multimillionaire or not. What mm. you should give a shit is you've got more money coming in than you've got going out. Yep. And then you're financially free, and freedom gives you the chance to breathe and think about what you want to do. Yep. And a lot of people could do it now. Mm. A lot of people stop buying the car you don't need. Mm. Stop going on a holiday you don't need. Get your cost down. Mm. Most of the people I ask, have you got a dream? The reason they can't do it, the costs are too high. Yeah. Right. So controlling that. But as you go, as people go on, all of a sudden they get married. All of a sudden they're in a job they don't like, but they're earning 150 grand in a bank. Exactly. They get grand. addicted to it. They get addicted to it. Then all of a sudden they've got a couple of cars on tick. All of a sudden yeah. one of the kids going to school. All of a sudden he's buying a watch and taking a family. And holiday. you know what they're doing? He's all these trapped. Things? The person trapped. I've got I've got mates of mine who are trapped. Yeah, trapped. Completely trapped. I've done a lot of research on this, and, and I and because I'm trying to help people get yeah. untrapped. So I spent a lot of time understanding how this all works. And in fairness, there'll be a lot of your listeners in this situation, mm. and the system has done it to them. The marketing of your, you know, you, the new car that's come out, you know, everyone wants to get a Tesla right now, right? Mm. So if you see your neighbor's got a Tesla, you feel like you should get one. If you've got, if you've got a small house, you think you should get a bigger house. Mm. Somehow it's going to make you happy. If you're doing something you don't love, the answer to being happy is owning something. That's a lot of people's direct correlation. So if I can go and have a holiday, experience is at least a bit better. Yeah. But then people think, I'm not happy, but if I buy myself a new car, they get a, they get an adrenaline rush for, for a, a week or two or for three. A couple of days, yeah. For, for me, it was a week. Yeah. I bought a Porsche mm. and I loved it for a week. It was always a dream of mine mm. to buy a Porsche. I went to the, when I came back from Hong Kong, I went straight to the showroom in Mayfair. Brands banker. Walked straight yeah. in, I had that one yeah. and gave them my credit card, paid for it all cash. It was like a dream to then drive the car out. You know that, I did that. Yeah. And for the first week it was, it was like, I've done it. Tick, tick that box and then it got a scratch yeah. like shit I've got a, and then it something went wrong with it I got yeah. take, next thing you know, I'm spending a whole day at that Mayfair garage a whole day of my life mm. sorting that car out week three that car owned me mm. couldn't wait to get rid of it mm. 
you know, I think the, um, but, you know, but that's what we're sold. I was sold it as a zero to seven year old. You know, here's a toy car. Oh, my God, it's mm. a Ferrari. So would you say a millionaire is a million pound in the bank? Or would you say a millionaire is if they own three or four properties, but they've got a hundred grand in that property, a hundred grand in that property? How would you explain? I'd rather ask, are you financially free? Yeah. Stop talking about millionaire or not a millionaire. Yeah. I, I, my stuff, we say multimillionaire because I have the money in the bank mm. and I have a house I own mm. and I'm financially free. I'm all of them. Yeah. Right, I have all of those things. Were you financially free and did you have freedom when you were working 24-7 in Hong Kong? No. No, okay. On paper, I was a millionaire. Yeah. But to your point, if I'd stopped selling when Helen stopped designing, yeah. there's a high chance that business would have collapsed. Mm. And then I go from on paper, respected in that town, to and built a company yeah. and a millionaire. I could I could say, yeah. I could stand on stage, I'm a multimillionaire. My business turnover, the profit yeah. on paper, I'm a multimillionaire. Yeah. No doubt about it. If you sell a business on average for 10 times profit yeah. or three times turnover, yeah. I'm a multimillionaire at that mm. point, right? Yeah. That's the standard definition of value of yeah. a business, yeah? So on both definitions, three times profit or 10 times turnover, I am a multimillionaire. Of course, 50% owned with Helen. 10 so times EBITDA. 10 times EBITDA, yeah. yeah okay. ten, ten, so the truth, however, is in any given moment, I could also be bankrupt. Yep. And this is what I always say to people when they're judging But that's what keeps people. you on your toes as an entrepreneur. Kind of. Yeah, but it, but it, it, because it's, it's that danger zone. Yes, but it's yep. also something that, the way I describe this, there'd be a lot of people that have this. Basically, if you stick a nail in your foot right now, you're going to feel it, right? Mm. You leave it 10 years, it will fester, you won't feel it anymore. And I think in a way, stress is a bit like that. There's good stress, the stress that keeps you alive. We need stress. And then there's an overdose, mm. right? And I think a lot of people put themselves on overdose. And the thing I learned two years after Helen woke me up was, I'm going to bring someone else in to run this company for two reasons. One, it's time I did something different, yeah. right? I've got all this knowledge. I'm no longer compounding it. I'm no longer compounding my knowledge. I've got to the peak of my knowledge running this company. I need to move to chairman. I need to move to an advisory role, <laughs> right? And, and and it sounds silly, yeah, you know, it sounds you. a silly title, I but I go from CEO to chairman. Sure, yeah. yeah. And actually it was really hard. I didn't want to because I had all this accolade. There's Simon Squibb. He built this company. Mm. Look at him go. He's brilliant. I walk in the room, I get any sale. Mm. Why would you not want that in the company? Yeah. Right? But then I brought someone else in. Were they as good as you? So I made a mistake at first. Yeah. The first person I brought in was a very good friend of mine. And they worked on what we call the client side in the industry. We call it the client side. They, he worked for a, a, a client. And I brought him in to run the business. And he was a friend. I trusted him. And I thought that was the most important thing. If anything else could be, could be trained. Because in my business, you could steal the clients. Yeah. Right? So you need someone at the top yeah. who you can trust. Yeah. And I trusted him. He wasn't right for the job. It took me a year and a half to find that out. And I couldn't quite let go because he couldn't quite do the job. Right, but he was a mate, and you were protecting him. He was a mate, him. and were you protecting him? I think I was hoping he would turn into what we call a nine and ten. Yeah, and this is no reflection on him. He, I, I, I think sometimes when we hire people, we hire what they could become, mm. and 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 I've learned a lesson the hard way. So the seven and eight rule is this: if you hire someone and you know they're rubbish, and they know they're rubbish, we wouldn't hire them. Well, not often you don't know till they start, right? You don't really yeah, know. Yeah. Sometimes I've hired people on the resume and yeah. they sound good and then they get into the job and they don't get on with the team or not, they don't gel yeah. the personalities. You don't actually know till they start, yeah. I found. So mm. these are like what we call one, twos and threes. Mm. They're pretty obvious. They don't like the job and, and you don't like them in the job. If you sit down and you're both honest with each other, they're going to leave and they're going to be happy. Mm. They might stay because they need the job. You might keep them because it's better than no one. Someone's picking up the phone. It's better yeah. than no one. Yeah. Right. So they're called one, twos, and threes. But quite often, as, as leaders, you can get rid of these people and they want to leave. You, yeah. You're doing them a favor. And they, yeah. Then on the other end, you have what we call the nines and tens. These are the superstars. Mm. I, my whole team is this, by the way. Mm, same. My team of 11, same. they're all nines and tens. It took me a long time to know what a nine and 10 looks like and keep. And, if, and nines and tens, you, you want to keep them at all costs. Yeah. You give them equity. Everybody in my company mm. has equity. Mm. You, you keep them. Because they're brilliant and they're hard to find and they gel, you get on with them. It's mm. magic. The problem is the seven and eights, right? And the seven and eights <laughs> are people that are, they have some traits you really like. Maybe they're mates. Maybe you can get on with them. But they're just not fucking good enough. Yeah. <laughs> and on the other side, true, they yeah. kind of like the job sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but they don't really want to quit because they quite like the job. And you both get stuck with each other. And there's a permanent frustration. Mm. 
And so I have a policy now, you know, if, if we if I'm complaining about that person more than twice in a month, yeah. then we have to have to sit down and make a change. Yeah. And it's getting rid of seven and eights is the hardest thing because both sides don't really want to do it. Yeah. And it becomes this awkward, difficult thing. Yeah. But your nine and tens leave if you don't deal with the seven and eights. Yeah. Fact. That is fact. So I hired a nine and ten. Good. That's what I did. I, I did amicably you find, split. Did you find from, that ever a seven and eight actually brought a a toxic environment into the office negativity of course that's a knock-on effect for everyone yes, else yes definitely and again it's not it's personalities a seven and eight does not equal you are rubbish at your job a seven and eight equals you are in the wrong job yes that's what it means so if you're wrong a seven environment. And eight, yeah if you're mm. a seven and eight you are not rubbish you probably should start your own business or be free or do something else or go work in another role yeah. you should do yourself a favor and yeah. make a change because you think you're a seven and eight mm. if your audience are listening there's gonna be some people that might identify with this yeah. they're not brilliant at their job they're not bad at their job you can be brilliant at your job mm. you're just in the wrong environment mm. and so it, it's a, it's not a reflection on that person as a whole it's a reflection of that person in that role at that moment or that person's been in the job too long and need to need to change this is it get out change yeah. now yeah I put a post out on yesterday on LinkedIn telling about people how how horrible it must be going to a job that you don't enjoy. Yep. How horrible it must be going to a job knowing you've got to wear the uniform, you've mm. got to be some sort of uniform, yep. or you've been told to do this. And how horrible it must be you come home and you're stressed from work and you're passing it down to your family. You know, this is the time to change. You know, got a huge response on LinkedIn yesterday, but this is the time to change. If you're sitting out there now feeling this is not for me, change it up because this life is way too short. It really is. The problem is... Because I say this sort of the stuff. Trap the trap of the stuff, money. Well, it's it's not only the trap of the money. And, and you know, it, it's a trap of the rich and the poor, this trap we're talking about. Yeah. The problem is your subconscious is far more powerful than, than you recognize. Mm. Like people listening right now are breathing without thinking about it. Mm. You have fears without thinking about it. Being scared of a spider, there's no logic to that. Mm. Right? We all know a spider cannot hurt you. Mm. But people have a fear of spiders. And I think... What I've come to realize is that when you're free like we are, mm. we sit in a privileged position of not having what we call a limiting belief system. Yeah. Right? People are living with a limiting belief system. They've been told maybe they're stupid. They're not, but that's what they've been told. They've not been given enough knowledge to be fully awake. They don't understand how money works. And with all of these bits and pieces missing from their jigsaw puzzle, it's not as easy as just one inspirational post and they get up and they make a change. Yeah. It is literally like a psychological battle that they lose because your subconscious takes over. Mm. That's what self-sabotage is. But self -sabotage, imagine getting up every day. Imagine you getting up every day or myself getting up every day going, I'm going to work. I've got a commute there. I yep. freaking hate my work. Yep. I'm not a fan of my boss. I'm not a fan of my line manager. And I'm pissed bored every day. I'm, I'm wasting my time. I meet these people every day. This is what my street content is about. Yeah. I meet these people every single day. I try to help a stranger who's trapped in so this. Just, so just, just on that note there, out of those 15 years, what year was it for you when you broke the back of that business, would you say? Yeah, 15 years in. So 2015, uh, I think I broke the back when I replaced myself. Really? Basically. Wow. That's when I was totally free. Wow. That's when I was truly rich. Yeah. Because I had dropped my ego. Yeah. I'd let someone else take over my baby. I'd let someone else get the glory. Mm for running that business. And big them up as well. Big them up, yep. give them every bit of support, yep. get out of their way, let yep. them make their own mistakes, yep. not tell them what to do all the time, not micromanage them. Yep. That's when I really, that's when I became a good businessman, if you ask me. And who bought your company? PricewaterhouseCooper, the largest accounts company in the world. Wow. And that deal came about. If anyone wants to know how to sell your business, it's very simple. Don't want to sell your business. Yep. And how do you sell a business when you don't want to sell a business? Mm. You do a great job. What happened is I got Guy in to run the business, Guy Parsonage to run the business, and he's brilliant. He came from a corporate world, so they also understood him. He came in to run the business because I built it up from scratch to this good company. I call this, I'm good at building a company from zero to 10. Yep. But there were people who are good at building a company from 10 to mm. 100. Mm. I love building things from scratch. Yes, I am. I've learned... I couldn't do what Mark Zuckerberg's doing. Uh, I don't, I don't want to do what big. Mark Zuckerberg's yep. doing. I wouldn't yeah. want that life, yep. right? So I recognize I don't want his life. Mm. I love building things up. There were people that love building things that are built up. They don't want to go through the pain yep. of building something up from scratch. They don't want to go through that risk. That's their profile. They want to build it 10 to 100. Mm. Guy was one of these people. He was, he was someone that could build it from 10 to 100. And PwC saw that. So if I was still running it, they probably wouldn't have bought the company. Definitely not. And that's a that's an insult to me because yeah. I'm telling people I've sold my company. People are yeah. like, wow, there's a guy that sold his company. He's yeah. a genius. 
But I sold my company because I learned I wasn't the best person to run that company so that it would get mm. bought. What year did you sell it? 2016, officially, I think the negotiations mm. and paperwork started in 2015. Yeah, it's bad. I'm really bad with years, it's by the way. No, it's fine, but it takes, I've sold a business, so it takes, what, it can take eight, ten months to sell it a took business. A year. Yeah, yeah, it took yeah. a year, and there was yeah. a lot of things that were out of my control, yeah. by the way, in that year. And a lot but, of bills to pay as well. Well, yeah. Accountancy, lawyers, it goes on and on. Yeah, and on, it's, it? yeah. it's huge. Luckily, uh, PwC being a semi-legal uh, yeah, organisation, they, they, they did what, a lot of that. How much did you get for your business? I'm not allowed to say. I, 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 I can say, though... It was more money than I'll ever need. Was it more or less than 20 million? I can't say. Was it more like, or less than like, 10 mil? guess million? who? Did he wear glasses? Unless he's got did ginger he look, hair. Do you have ginger Spot hair? Yeah. yeah. Um, more or less than 10 mil? I can't say. I, I'm, I'm, I've always been, I always, more, want, I, I always more, want to say. More than I'm, five mil? I'm not allowed to say. Two, I, I just want to say. I Hold on, hold on. Hold on. More, or less than, more or less than two mil? I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> A lot more than that, but okay. I can't say. Okay, respect. Um, but I, 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 I worked out that, um, and this might give away the number, so I have to be careful. But I worked out that if I live to one hundred with the money that dropped in my bank that day, I could live an extravagantly nice, comfortable life for those years and never have to worry about money again. And that's if I made no investments and did yeah. n nothing but put that money in a bank. Why can't you say? Because when you when you sign a deal, it's yeah. a, it's a it's a private company. Yeah. And they don't want the value of the business to be pinned to what I sold the business for. Yeah, okay. And and when a company um, buys a business, they technically don't want their customers that were my customers. Yeah. Don't want to, to, no, they no. don't want to have to publicly talk about the amount of money that customer base yeah. is worth. Okay. Right? Because of that customer. There's lots of reasons behind it. A lot of paranoid reasons behind yeah. it. It was actually something I tried to change in the contract because, mm. of course, I want to say how much. Mm. Right? It's kind of, I'm, how, kind of, I'm very much? proud of it. How much? I'm not allowed to say <laughs> I've got used to not saying it now. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say it the day the day you that I to say, I've been wanting to say it since I sold it. Yeah. Did they but, put a say it in the contract to say you're not allowed to say it? Yeah. I have said it privately to people, but I can't say it. I can't say it loud on air. No, it's still being recorded. <laughs> it's still recorded. I know. Tell you'll me get after. me. You'll get me. <laughs> um, I just don't want any repercussions. Yeah. No, I, I but off that. camera, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, but I, I um, I I tell me that feeling for you when you sold the company. Because when you sell a company, you think everyone's going to be coming out of the woodwork and celebrating a champagne. To, it's all a bit of a, oh, is that it? Yeah. What's going to celebrate? What I mean, we sold ours. We just went out to the boat and had a champagne. It's like, we carry on with life again. Yeah, well, it's, I don't even drink alcohol, so I didn't no. even have champagne. I, yeah. I've never drank alcohol my whole life, so I didn't even have champagne. What did you, <laughs> what did you, what was the feeling like for you? It, I had mixed feelings. I, I think that I don't want, it was so much money suddenly in my bank account. Mm. You know, it's a bit like buying a Porsche. I had that euphoria moment, definitely. I realized how far I'd come. It was a moment of reflection. Yeah. I'd come from, you know, a really hard beginning, I think, mm. and a really tough first five years of my life. Mm. And and I'd made it. And and for the first time in my life, for the first time, you I felt... didn't have to worry about money. Yeah. And how old were you? Uh, I was 30, uh, 39, I think. 39, okay. Yeah. And that journey there has moved into this unbelievable journey that we've seen over the last couple of years. Yeah. Was there a period in between that journey there, which you had been, what, 40 and you're 49 now? When was it when you said, right, I want to become an influencer? Or, or did you accidentally become an influencer? Or were you such a, such a creative mind, you're thinking, actually, there's an opportunity here to give back to the people in the UK who are maybe stuck in their lives? In short, when I sold my company, mm. I, it was the first time I'd had that experience. First time I had all this money in the bank. Previous to that, it was all on paper wealth. It yep. wasn't real wealth. Like, Which like doesn't it was, mean anything. It was yeah. actually in the yeah, bank. Yeah. I well, could go out and spend that money. Massive respect, by the way. Anyone Thank who you. sells a company, massive respect. Thank you. I, I, yeah. I, it was one of the bucket list items. Yeah. To build a company up yeah, and, and it. sell it yeah. as a concept. Every entrepreneur talks about it. Yep. It was a huge disappointment, though. Mm. And like I said earlier, every good thing comes with a bad thing. Yep. Every, every bad thing comes with a good yep. thing. This was a good thing. I built a company up and I'd sold it. I'd become truly financially free, truly, for the rest of my life. Yep. But it came with some weird demons because I then, um, I had another company that I'd, I'd started, a company called Nest, which was investing in startups. It was doing quite well. But I think because suddenly I had all this money in the bank, it was the first time I just suddenly felt financially free. Mm. And I decided to also sell that business. And then I decided to move back to England and buy a house. And that's what I did. Mm. And um, luckily, 
um, I had one amazing distraction into my life. My son got born. And I spent the next year and a half being really a present dad and mm -hmm. being there every step of the way in those early years, which I felt really lucky yeah, to do because yeah. I know that my brothers who had kids when they were much younger, they were out working. Yeah. They weren't there for the first year and a half, two years of their children's yeah. lives. So I really enjoyed it. You know, I didn't didn't spare a pound on anything. We yeah. bought the best pram, bought mm -hmm. it new. I didn't have to do All my brothers had to buy them cheap and it mm -hmm. was hard. I just enjoyed the whole thing. And, and for the first six months, I owned that experience yeah. and it was amazing. And I started to get back into shape because I had let myself go a little bit and I really started to like build out a whole new life. And then um, slowly, um, I the demons of my past kind of came forward. Like I realized since I left home and been, you know, been in the early years of like building a business, I'd shut off all my emotions about my father dying. I'd shut off all the emotions of my mum basically deserting me. I'd gone from a household of, you know, a mum and dad and three brothers, you know, a full household to being all on my own. And I just shut it all off and I just head down to build a life and I hadn't addressed it mm. properly. And so I started getting therapy and started talking about it. And it was like opening up a can of worms, you yeah. can argue, but I'm glad I did. And I, I think this is also why I think a lot of people die in retirement because yeah. they suddenly have to have self-reflection. Yeah. And you're like, well, what have I done with my life? Yeah. And and I um, I had a, a few months there where I was a little bit depressed yeah. and lost and soulless. I had my son, which was amazing. But even then, you're a bit sleep deprived when mm. you have a kid, which doesn't help when you're trying to think about your future. I didn't know who I was anymore. I was Simon Squibb. The entrepreneur. I was Simon Squibb that built Fluid. I was Simon Squibb that built Nest, this yeah. company in Hong Kong that was doing well as well. And suddenly I'm Simon Squibb. I look after my son, yeah. which for some reason didn't feel yeah. purposeful. Yeah. And I didn't need to chase money anymore, which is also the first time. Yeah. So, so the motivation of having to go and earn money. If I said to my wife, I'm going out now, I've got 18 hours today. Uh, when are you doing money, right, to pay for this house we're living in? We've yeah. got a baby now. It's almost a good excuse to get out of the house. Yeah. I didn't have that. Yeah. Right? I didn't have that <laughs> excuse. And so um, I had a really, and it's a really privileged place to be. So I don't want to, I don't mm. want to paint it as not a privilege, but I had a really difficult time. Mm. Uh, I lost my identity. I didn't know what to do next. And then, um, were you lonely? Um, I, I wasn't lonely. I, 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 I like having a few deep relationships, and and I had my wife, um, and I was enjoying being a father. I think. Loneliness is an interesting question. I think I, I just, I lacked purpose. Yeah. I just felt a sense of what's the point yeah. of it all. But if, if, if you're looking from the outside, you come in, you build a business up, you're at it every day. Yeah, drive, exactly. Drive, drive, yeah, drive. I'm the main non -stop. face. I'm the main face. Sell your business, load of money in the bank. Yeah. You come back to England, you haven't had relationships in England for yes. 21 years. Yes. You come back and got a beautiful house, yeah. got six six month old baby or a year yeah. and a half, you got a lovely wife. It's like, yeah. Why am I not happy? Why am I not happy? What else yeah. am I going to do? Exactly. I need to be doing something. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sort of guessing, and that's why you've popped up in the last three years and become a massive face on the whole social media scene. Yeah, I woke up again. Another yeah. type of awakening. Yeah. It's a very privileged awakening. Very privileged. But it's I, but it's an awakening everyone can give themselves. Do you know what's so interesting? I, I anyone anyone listening to this, though, to know that you sold out for copious amounts of millions and then for, for you to say, actually, was depressed. I think right. people listening go, how can What's you be depressed? What's yeah. wrong with him? I totally understand yeah. it. I understand people's sentiments as well. Yeah. And I think that the, um, it's, it, the, the, the good thing is, though, if people, you know, I say this is a good thing. People might relate if they went through COVID and you're sitting at home and you're not meeting your colleagues anymore. You're, you're, not, you're not energized. You're told to stop working for whatever in your furloughed. Yeah. People will know the feeling I'm talking about a little bit. Like, and that's why I go back to the rats eating themselves. Yeah. Right. If, if, if universal basic income won't solve our problem. And take it from someone that's got rich, yeah. right? It won't solve our problem. So we need purpose. And that's what I discovered for myself. Mm -hmm. And I and, and I think when people look at what I'm doing today, so what am I doing today? I'm building a competitor to LinkedIn where we help each other. And that's called right. helpbank.com. Help and what actually is that? So you go there and you can get help. So go where? Go on. You go on the platform okay. and you can, you can ask for help. And people on that, there's 100,000 people on there looking to help you. We've also built a very advanced AI, basically my brain in a robot helping you that's, you da that's dangerous. dangerous very that's dangerous. dangerous i think it loves helen <laughs> so the point is the point is that you know you can linkedin is amazing but you go on there and you don't you're flexing most of the time yeah. you're showing off what you know you're showing off what you've got you can't really go on there and ask for help it doesn't feel like a place you so where can you go and ask for help where where can people go today to get help 
Not, so, many, not many places in on the business side of things. Exactly. Mm. And frankly, in life. But let's just say on the business side, mm. for starters, because most of the time, people's lives are tied up in business. Yeah. So where can you go? If you've got a dream, where can you go to get help with it? If you're struggling with your business, where can you go to get help? And there's nowhere. So the simple premise was, why don't we build somewhere where the whole idea is not give and take, it's give without take. You know, we used to all live in tribes. Yeah. And I don't even know if I'm allowed to use the word tribe mm. anymore, but we used to all live in tribes. Tribes are 5,000. It's technically proven our brain can remember 5,000 names. If you're not, your brain hasn't gone to mush and it hasn't been sucked up by bullshit media, <laughs> you can remember 5,000 names. I don't care how bad your memory is. Why? Because we used to live in tribes of 5,000. And the idea was that I help someone in my tribe. And if that person in my tribe is helped and happier, the whole tribe yeah. is happier. Yeah. I wasn't expecting to get something back from that person I've just helped. That person is a happier tribe member. They go help someone in that tribe. That, that person in that tribe gets help. That person in that tribe gets help. And one day, karma, we call it today, I need help and the right person will turn up to help me. Yep. My tribe. We've lost that. Yep. Because banks lent us money to buy a house. We bought a house. We closed the door. We forgot that we're actually meant yep. to be helping the person at the end of the street who's struggling. Yep. We've forgotten that because I've got a house. Fuck you. Yeah. Right? We've forgotten what we're this actually is, meant to this do. This is really powerful. This it's, is really it's, powerful. It's a problem in society yes. that we have been pushed into. Yeah. And I think that I... This help bank is really powerful. Now you're explaining it. Hmm. I think it's going to change the world if we can make it work. Yeah. And what have people got to do to make this work? A combination of, you it's know, you know what? People. It's, well, not, yeah. it's not even about going on my platform. Mm. It's about mindset. Of course, if people go on my platform, then I'll be able to grow it. I'll be able to uh, f finance it long term so it can become a real competitor for LinkedIn. Of course, I want people to go on the platform. Yeah. But really, it's not about people going on my platform. Mm. It's about mindset shift, that we're not in it for ourselves. If we're in it for the ourselves, the rats are going to eat each yeah. other. The 1% will build a house in the sky so high, yeah. and live. The yeah. rest of us will die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, And, and we, we just need to start helping each other. Yeah. You know, it's just that simple. So give me an example, if I went on to Help Bank, how I can help people. Right. So, um, well, you're an experienced entrepreneur. Mm. So um, here's the thing. I know you want to help people. Mm. And a lot of people listening will want to help people. Mm. The problem with helping people is you don't have much time. So the idea is we create a place where the person who's helping, it's convenient for them to go and help. Yeah. So people go on there who need help. They post up a question or a problem or an issue they've got. And then it's left there for the person to go in and see that and problem help. and oh, help. Okay. So okay. It, it's really designed to help the person helping help. Yeah. Now, if you help someone, you're going to discover something really interesting. This is what I discovered. Mm. This is why I'm now on this journey. Mm. I realized that helping someone else actually made me happy. Yeah, it does. It made me a lot happier yeah. than buying myself a fancy sports car yeah. and a big house. And a pram that my, uh, my 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 wife wanted. Every, all the stuff I yeah. want. None of it gave me the same joy as helping someone. And here's the key: yeah. without any expectation of anything back. Yeah. That literally lit a fire in me that in my career I realised had been lit. Like when I was helping CNN, I had a similar feeling of helping them. Then they pay me, and it felt like it was sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. But I never had. I invested in people's businesses. My nest. Mm. I'd buy ten percent in your company. Mm. I still do this today. I invest mm. in businesses. I help you for ten percent of your company. This was the first time in my life I was financially able, you could argue, to think about nothing but helping that person with no catch. I didn't need anything back. Yeah. I didn't need any money back yeah. from them. And four years now. I've helped thousands and thousands of people and never asked for anything back. Someone offered me ten thousand pounds the other day to help them for an hour. I said, "I help you for free." Yeah, it's the most liberating thing because yeah. you know when you help someone for free, the other thing that not only do you feel free, yeah. your advice is neutral. I go back to Glenn when he worked at the hotel with me. His advice was tainted by his need to get something out. Of yeah. Him. It's just we've been trained to think it's give and take. It's yeah. not. It's give about take. But we believe give and take is fair. So we we'll only help someone if they're going to help us and we get something out of them. And that means we've lost our tribal instincts, which makes us unhappy. Mm. That's partly why we have depression. So prevalent today, in mental health issues, in my opinion. I right? agree. Without, I, yeah. without this ingredient of community, we're feeling the pain. Mm. It's not talked about enough. Mm. So Help Bank, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to uh, meet some politicians next week and I hate them. Right. I hate all these politicians. Yeah. I'm going there to show them how I have built a competitor to the job center. Yeah. We call it the dream center where people can go and pitch, not just getting a job, but getting their dream 
a reality, making their dream a reality. I love this. And, and, and they could What's compete it called? with the me. The dream, the dream factory. Wow. Right? They they could compete with me or do it. I give it all to them for nothing. Yeah. I know they won't fucking do it because yeah. it won't get them elected. Yeah. Right? But it would help people. Now, my point is, this isn't about me building a platform and making tens of millions. Yeah. I'm happy if that happens because yeah. that's more money I can give away. Yeah. Right? But when you say, what can people do to help me? They can just change their mindset and know this one thing. It's not give and take, it's give without take. Yeah. If people change their mindset, we might survive this bloody thing. Mm. The planet is going to be fine without us. We shouldn't be trying to save the planet. We should be trying to save the human race. Mm. And we're going to eat each other if we don't start helping each other. Mm. Really powerful, Simon. Really powerful what you're doing, this whole shift, this whole mindset change. And it's needed. It's really needed. Moving on to your social media platforms, when you're meeting strangers in the streets, which I love, by the way. Tell me about that journey and what are you actually doing with those strangers? Are you giving them the, the power to think what they want to do in life, that they can move forward and say, I can go and do my dream job. Why am I stuck in McDonald's? Or, I don't want to use McDonald's, but Boots, McDonald's, whatever job you're doing. I'm stuck. You're giving them the power to go, I will give you money to go and start your dream job. So like all good things in life, sometimes they start from a selfish beginning. Mm. So I started this journey of going on social media and sharing knowledge. We did it in Clubhouse. Yep. There was there were some people that were sharing knowledge trying to get money out of it, yeah. right? And there were some of us that yeah. were sharing knowledge just, just because yeah. we needed community, yeah. right? We yeah, felt yeah, like yeah. we were used And that was 2020, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. I lose track. Yeah, so um, I still think I'm 30, just for anybody <laughs> listening. Um, but I think initially I... I was helping people on social media. I was doing what everybody did back in 2020, talking head. Yeah. This is how you raise money. This yeah. is how you build a business. Sharing my knowledge, getting it out, right? Yeah. And um, one time I was on TikTok sharing knowledge and then suddenly someone gave me a gift. And bear in mind, I've been saying, look, I'm a real multimillionaire. I'm mm -hmm. not one of these fake multimillionaires yeah. that is about to sell you a course. Yeah, There's lots of them out there. There's lots of Jesus, them out there, yeah. and, and, and I get a lot of stick for this because mm. there are some courses that are worth paying for. Fair mm. enough. I'm just saying that me, as a successful entrepreneur, I will not charge people for a course because if I want to make money, I start a business. Yeah. I don't need to charge you a fee. I, I actually genuinely believe that if someone, and let's pick on an industry that I know is sensitive, but let's say the property industry. If someone's mm. making so much money in property, they're so fucking successful yeah. in property. Why are they doing a course? Then why sell to some kid yeah. A course. Yeah. Why not just fucking help them? Yeah. You know, you're making so much money in property anyway. You're so brilliant at property. Just great good. Yeah. Help those people over there. You can. You can. You're making so much money doing this. Yeah. Just help them. So I, I have a, a serious like glitch when people tell me they're running a course business because I'm like, well, if you're so successful, if they're selling an entrepreneur course, mm. I'm like, I, there's something wrong. Mm. Because most people that are studying a course, they're making the money from the course. They actually never made real money, in yeah. my opinion. And, and, and what I wanted to kind of, what happened was I was on TikTok helping someone for free and saying this, that I'm helping people for free. I don't need any money. And then I came off the live and I made 120 pounds on the live. I was like, wow, I just made money on TikTok. And I've been telling everybody I'm helping them for free and I've just made money off helping people. So I went out with that money and I went into a supermarket because so I had to get some stuff and I saw someone stacking some shelves mm. and I said I just thought it just came to me I'm like what, what's your dream I didn't have a camera on me or anything I just like what's your dream and they said oh, I dream of opening up my own business one day blah 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 I was like here's 120 quid I'll be your first customer mm. and I'm like yeah. my god is this a trick you yeah. know? and I just saw their it's eyes like beetles light up about, beetles about yeah but there was no camera on me no. this, this first time no, yeah. no camera on me I was just like wow this feels good yeah. this feels right and I thought, right. Then I, I remember I text the team. I'm like, I'm going to do this more. And I went into a Pizza Express. And this time I did it with my camera. I'm like, what's your dream? And the guy went, oh, my dream is to open up my own bar one day. I'm like, okay, I'll help you. Here's a bit of money. And here's, and I'll promote you on my social mm. media. The guy's like, all right, mate. <laughs> kind of looking at me weirdly. <laughs> Thanks, like, mate. Do one. Well. Yeah, it's like weird. <laughs> um, and then we posted it up and it went viral. Yeah. And, and I was like, this is fucking amazing. Because mm. now we've got, we can take social media and make it have social good. Yeah. I never wanted to be famous. Mm. I've become famous. Mm. I never wanted to be famous. I mm. never wanted fame. I didn't you've, become, you've become famous for the right reasons. Yeah, I love being on the right side like, of history. For a prime example, I've got 12 full-time staff out there. I know I put it in the diary, Simon Scripto now. The 20, the 20 year olds, the 21, 22, oh my God, so he's the guy from TikTok. Oh my God, can I get a photo of them? I was yeah. like, 
What was Simon? Yeah, of course you can when he comes out. I, you know, it's actually interesting in that age group. Well, it's people and say older to, as well. People say to me, um, you know, what's it like to be famous? And I find that question really weird yeah. at my age that this, this has happened to me. But I think that um, I think fame for the right reasons is really special. Yeah, I agree. I, I want to be on the right side of history, yeah. and I and I think I am. I'm on the side of just making people believe in themselves and helping mm. people get there, not just complaining about mm. all the problems we've got, but actually mm. providing a solution. I think that's very important. A lot of people out there raving about what's problems are and conspiracy theories about what the problems are. And, yeah. We need solutions yeah. to these things. And I think well, I'm really enjoying it because most of the people that come up to me are literally like hugging me, wanting to shake my hand, yeah. treat me with respect. I, I, I really appreciate it. Out of the three years of you doing social media, let's say three years, right? Yeah. When just, did we start speaking? Four, 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 say, four, say four yeah. years. I'm getting confused. Three, three and a half years. Yeah. Like I always, I'm a, what, I'm a believer that something takes a thousand days. Right. That That's, sounds about right. For me, a thousand days, whether you're doing a podcast where you're setting up a festival, whether you're doing a, any any business that you're doing, I always believe you put a thousand solid days in and you're consistent, da, 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 you will pop. Yeah. How long did it take you, would you say? Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah. Um, I would add one other ingredient yeah. into it. Um, when uh, Jack and Callum joined the team with me that was an exponential growth because i i was consistent and doing it every day but having uh, talia join me i create this is the, your creative my team you. okay yeah my team joined. so today you've got 12 creatives that work for you 11 people 11 yeah um and and but the uh i think the combination of consistency yep. alongside infrastructure yeah so i i um i i Talia was my first ever person. And what was she doing? She was helping me organize the podcast guests. She was helping me organize. I think we did a big promotion with TikTok. She, she's super organizer. Yeah. Still with me today. Yeah. Super, super organizer. Incredible. That was one step towards success because I was consistent and I had her help. Yeah. And then on the social she media side. She was key, side, by the way. She was key. Absolutely. At that time. On the social, but I, I wouldn't say I was famous on social media at that point. No. Because Talia's skill was not social media. Yeah. Right. And then I brought in Jack and Callum and their skill is social media. Yeah. And we fine tuned the whole thing to what it is today. So I can't take credit all on my own. I have been every single day working hard on helping people. I have been delivering on my promise to help people at no cost. I help people at no cost. And now our business makes money. Yeah. We make money from sponsors. We make money from our affiliate program on helpbank.com. Yeah. I take that money and I put it back into the system. The profit we make goes back to paying people to help them do yeah. what they love, right? Yeah. But all of that happened, a combination of 1,000 days, yep. as you say, of mm. public consistency, mm. on top of infrastructure to help you scale. Mm. And I think people are still important. Yeah. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the team that I have. And I'm not just saying that because I know they'll be listening. I genuinely, genuinely believe it. And people listening, if you want to learn, uh, people hear things in snippets, don't they? They hear, well, if I practice something 1,000 days, Tiger Woods, practice every day for 1,000 days and you'll be a golfer. No, he needed the right coach. He yeah. needed the right nutritionist. He needed the right psychiatrist yeah. probably by by judging his personality yeah. at this point, yeah. right? He needed all of those things. Mm. It's not just 1,000 days. Yeah. You need to have infrastructure and you need to invest in yourself. Yeah. People are so busy spending money on the stock market yeah. buying a house doing all this no shit. investment on personal development I, zero yeah agree and i and I, uh, that's the shocking thing people will go out there and they'll get a car loan for three years which yeah. means they're basically working for the bank paying Trapped. that for the next yeah. three years but ask them to spend 50 quid on themselves i mean investing themselves yeah. investing in a little side house of their own they're like oh they're probably not i don't know what mm. i'm doing mm. the staircase you bought tell me about that yeah where is it is it twickenham Twickenham, just off the high street behind the back of Starbucks. And where are you, where are you, where are you based? Around um, there? I'm I basically based full-time. Do I give my exact address to help people come and, <laughs> come come and, and visit come me? And, come um, and ask for a heads up. I live at Entrepreneur House in Tunbridge Wells. Yeah. Uh, Is that so what you call it? Entrepreneur House? Entrepreneur House. Quality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, Why Tunbridge Wells? Tunbridge Wells is... Not I'm, close to Twickenham. No, not at all. Um, but totally because the my son, when he hit, I was living in North London. Yep. Um, I was neighbours with Ricky Gervais yep. in North London. I loved it there, um, and I'd see Ricky Gervais every day. He's the only he's the only celebrity I like, yep. so I would see him every day, which yep. made me happy. And um, but then when we came to schooling for my son, I think the school system's broken, mm. and I didn't want him to go into a traditional school system, either the private sector or the or the traditional school system. Yep. So uh, we decided to make a move to a, a forest school. Yeah. So my son is ninety percent of his days Brilliant. outside. Brilliant. Well, there's they not that they many call, forests. They call it that school. What do they call that kind of? School? They call it a forest. School. Just a forest school. Yeah, okay. you're, you're, it was another a, name for it. Wasn't there's a there. Fulbright Oil School, yeah. and you've got a Montessori, Montessori model. Yeah, okay. But a Montessori school is different to a forest okay. school. Okay. So, but, what made you buy that staircase? <laughs> instinct. Yeah. Instinct. 
I fucking hate property. I think it's become, it's a basic human need that's become a commodity. Yep. And monopoly was invented by a woman to highlight the problem when you put property and capitalism together. I'm a capitalist. Yep. I made my money capitalistically. Yep. But I believe there's a line to be drawn. And I think accommodation is one of them. It's a basic human need. Yep. And when you see a staircase go up for sale in London <laughs> and people are like, <laughs> like literally they're like, it's a normal thing to buy a staircase that's, <laughs> and turn it into a flat, yep. which is the pitch. Right, buy this staircase and turn it into a flat. Is that what the pitch was for yeah. someone to buy the... Yeah, and you can oh, get plain permission okay. and turn it into a flat and make half a million pounds right, okay. profit, right? I'm so sick of this. Yeah. Right, we need to get away from... A accommodation is a basic human need. Yeah. And if we keep making accommodation a business, the problem is the nurse that's going to save you tonight mm. in the emergency ward, one in three nurses are going to food banks. Yeah. Is that so, right? So the nurse you're gonna, who's going to help you tonight is malnutritioned. Mm. That's not the right has malnutrition because the rent's too high. Yeah. They can't make ends meet. The NHS can't pay them more money. Yeah. There isn't any more money. And literally because somebody bought that house and said, I'm going to get 8% out of this one. Yeah. I'm going to squeeze yield out of this house. Yeah. It's not meant to be a business. Cancel, buy to let, let mm. cancel it. Mm. It's not a real business and it's killing society's infrastructure, in my opinion. Mm. I am a capitalist, though. Mm. I don't want people to think I'm a socialist when mm. they hear this. It's just like some things need a bit more analytical review and the property market is one of them. Mm. I bought the staircase as symbolism of the ludicrous nature of the property market and to say, full stop, let's stop this. And everybody said, oh, you're going to turn it into a flat lounge? No, I'm going to turn it into a pop-up that people can go and use for free to start their dream, right? And I'm hoping, with planning permission, people will be able to sleep there and do it. Mm. And then me and the team brainstormed it and we just discovered this morning, I thought this was my idea, but it turns out it's not. Dudley on my team, I said, let's cut out a, a, a hole in the door. Yeah. And so people can post in their dreams. I brought a bag of letters with me mm. today to show you, right? Mm. People can post in their dreams through that letterbox. That was my original idea. And then let's put a live feed on there for people to come and say hello. And Dudley said, hey, Simon, why don't we put a, a ring doorbell on there? Mm. And then people can press the doorbell and pitch to it. Well, like, brilliant. That's, that's genius. What, I thought it was my idea until this morning. We had to double check. Big this shout out to Dudley for that. Big shout out to Dudley. I thought it was my idea. I was taking full credit, <laughs> um, but it wasn't. So the evolution so of the staircase. How long, was that, how long have you had the staircase for? And how so, many people have come and sent their dream through the letterbox? So legally, I think at this point, we've had it six weeks. Yep. It has been insane. Hundreds and hundreds of people. Well, have you just gone showed there. me all the letters that come through yesterday. It's crazy. It must have about forty or fifty there already. Absolutely crazy. And and you know what I've realised in doing this is there really is nowhere for people to go and get help. Yeah. Right. So a doorbell in Twickenham. We have people flying in for it, by the mm. way. So it's not just a UK problem. Mm. But we had someone the other day drive from Scotland to go and press that doorbell and pitch their dream and get some help. Yeah. Right. Because there is no place to go. And get help. Why is that? That's mad, isn't it? When you think about it like that. That's what I mean. We were never taught business. We were never taught entrepreneurship. We were never taught anything about day life. Never taught to be a dad. We, that's, a, that's a whole new subject. We yeah, could, we could do a whole episode. Of, yeah, yeah that just, whole I could dad talk thing. forever as Same, well. same yeah. here. But yeah, I mean, I think I think the thing is, so now people can go press the doorbell, yeah. pitch their dream. What, let you hold it and say, Simon, just I've ring, got an idea. Ring us. You're yeah. like ringing it. You're like, and, you, and the clips are like, hi, um, I, this is my dream. This is what I'd love to do. And... We're making it happen for people and we're making it happen for a community. Mm. So we take that clip, we edit it a bit so people can read text. So we spend a bit of time and money yeah. on it and then we upload it to our community of 3 million people. And most of these videos so far were a bit subjected to the algorithm, but yeah. they're going viral. Yeah. And then, for example, Jake, he went there and pitched four weeks ago. Yeah. He pressed the doorbell and said, I'm working eight hours a day. I'm really struggling, but I've got a dream to do my own car detailing business. It doesn't have to be, you know, like I'm building the next yeah. LinkedIn. It can yeah. be a, just a thing you want to do that yeah. you want to do that you enjoy. So what right? are you doing then? Are you saying I'll pay for that? So a combination in that particular example, he pitches to the doorbell. We upload it. It goes viral. People in the comments DMing him. I'll be your customer. I'll be your customer. I'll be your customer. He's now got four customers paying him. Because sometimes to start a business, all you need is one yeah, customer paying yeah. you, right? Someone who believes in you. Exactly. On top of that, and we're about to drop a YouTube video on this. I'm mm. giving you an exclusive mm. before the video drops. Uh, but we uh, we then basically got experts in that business yeah. that have done that business before. A guy called Adam Smith, who's been in that business before, to come and help him, yeah. mentor him, support him. And then we built a whole marketing thing where we go and basically promote him. So he's actually, if my car's sitting outside here, mm. he's wrapped it. Mm. he's wrapped it and then it says on my car if you hate your job honk your horn 
Isn't that a t-shirt? This is a What's Your Dream t-shirt by another what's entrepreneur. Dream, maybe a t-shirt. And, if you yeah. hate your job, honk your horn. Honk your horn. Love it. And then we did a video of driving around. How many people honk their horn like a survey? <laughs> right? So basically, we promote his business through fun. Yeah. And one of the things we're trying to do, which I think is... So you say honk your horn if you hate your job. And yeah. what is his business? Car wrapping. Car wrapping. But we've used his service to wrap my car. Yeah. Uh, to do a survey, survey. of who makes their job, <laughs> right? So it's kind of fun. We yeah. have fun yeah. education as a model. That's yeah. basically how we operate, right? We basically want to teach people things, but we don't want to preach to people. Mm. We also want to help the people who are having a dream mm. be, and be creative. So another example, we had someone who uh, pressed the doorbell and they dreamed of opening up their uh, own doggy daycare yeah. center. So uh, we saw that clip and we put it up and it's gone viral. And then uh, we decided to buy a car and wrap it as a dog. Have you seen Dumb and Dumber? Yeah. The dog yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. So we created a dog. <laughs> we created a dog car first in Britain, and we almost drove it here today Quality. to show you. And we then uh, messaged her, say, "Can we meet you? Give us a day. We'd like to talk to you." So we met her. We pulled up in the dog car. We gave her the dog car as a marketing vehicle. So we're like, "This car is yours, right?" And then we drove from London to the Isle of Wight where there was a dog show going on. We hadn't booked anything. We drove there in the dog car. The happiest drive I've ever had, by yeah, the way. Bet, I cut I someone bet. up by accident and yeah. they didn't mind because yeah, yeah, I'm in a dog yeah. car. You can't be angry with someone in a dog car, can you? Yeah. And we, um, by the way, now I want to drive the dog car all the time because yeah. the energy that people give you when they, yeah. they can't be angry at you when they see a dog yeah. car. They just can't. People just smile at you. <laughs> people are waving, sticking their cameras out the window. Anyway, we drive all the way to the Isle of Wight. We pull up at this dog event that we've never been to. We don't know the organizers. And we say, we've got a dog car. Can we please be, into, be allowed to go into your event? Mm. So the organizer breaks all the rules in the book, lets us into this middle of this crazy busy event. We pull the dog car into the middle of the event and we set up her dog stand and she starts grooming dogs Brilliant. and we launch her business. Brilliant. And she gets 11 customers there and then. Brilliant. And they post up on social media. And then at the end, and there are some businesses that need money. We gave her some money. Yeah to help her. Basically, what I try to do is not necessarily fund the whole thing because yeah. I think it's important yeah, no, people need, learn the grit and the skill to build it themselves. Yeah. But we do give people money to break free. So she needs £2,000 a month yeah. and I think she needs three months to make this business yeah. work. So we gave her £6,000 so she's free for three months and she can go tell her boss to fuck off. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> her boss is an asshole. Yeah. So, uh, so she's free. We free her from the shackles for a while and then we help her. She's now part of our community me, the team, and the community will helping try to make her dream come true. Now, it mm. might not still happen. I fingers crossed it will. Mm. But we are there to help her make her dream happen. She's not alone trying to make her you're dream a, happen. You're a really good man, Simon. I'm trying to be a better man. Mate, you're a really good man. This is really powerful. I'm really, really enjoying this. How much money do you reckon you've given away? <laughs> so... um we were doing a quick calculation. I think probably just over a hundred and hundred thousand pounds now, roughly. Yeah. Um, but we are starting to make money. So I have sponsors now. Yeah. So uh, I could list them all off now, but we have go on, brand go on, tell me sponsors. Tide Banking. Yep. Are sponsoring us. GoDaddy. Yep. Are sponsoring us. Adobe are sponsoring us, and I only partner with products I believe in. Yeah. And products that can help people start businesses. Yeah. So GoDaddy offer, you can build a website yeah. for free for a month. Yeah. You could get your business up and running, have a website for a month before you have to pay anything. Mm. So I'm only partnering with brands that I believe can actually help people do what they mm. want to do. So we had a crypto company originally approach us to pay us a shitload of money. To I'm not doesn't doing it. Yeah, I'm not interested. Yeah. It doesn't help our entrepreneurs be successful. Yeah. We don't work with that brand. Mm. But they are paying us and we're using that money to fund mm. this content. Mm. So I, I will keep putting money in. I personally put Seven hundred thousand pounds of my own money into the platform so far. What my help, own help bank? Help bank and building seven hundred Gs already. Seven hundred thousand, yeah. It's funny because people people will but say seven hundred Gs on people working on that full time with you every day. Yeah, and also alongside. I mean, I've been doing this nearly four years and I've had no income, right? Yeah. So I mean, not like paying Talia who joined me at the beginning yeah. every month. So it's a combination of team, investment. Yeah, okay. I did a competition with TikTok. We gave away a load of money. Yeah. TikTok didn't pay me. I did a partnership with TikTok. Yeah, okay. So I, I paid out for all of those things. So I invested in myself. Yeah. You know, you could argue. Selfish. I built the platform up. I yeah. built the Simon Squibb platform up. But then I switched it. This platform isn't about promoting Simon Squibb. This yeah. platform is about pay, promoting people's dreams. Yeah. I, I love it when a video goes viral of someone's dream. Yeah. I don't really care if I'm in it or not. Yeah. I, I do a lot of videos now just on my phone. Yeah. And I don't even want to be in it. I don't need yeah. to be in it. In fact, the doorbells replace me. 
That's really exciting. You know, talk about business management. Yeah. That doorbell now is a little bit replaced me. I've spent the last two years going into the street and yeah. every single day, you know, recording. Now people can just go to the doorbell and press a button and pitch their dream. Mm. You don't need me anymore. Mm. You've got an old, you've got a lot, a lot of energy. A lot of energy. And you're at this every day, creating, opening doors, creating opportunities, meeting people, having a wonderful team of 11 people around you filming, going back content. How is your wife? <laughs> Knackered? Knackered, yeah. <laughs> no. I, How's I, Helen today? Well, Helen's the opposite to me. Yeah. So she, and this is good. But She's my wife's completely opposite to me as well. And I get it. But I understand what you're going through. You're a go-getter. You're this, driving, driving, driving. We can do this. We can do that. I want to help more people. Help people. Is she like, crack on, Simon? Well done, as long as no, you're she here. She helps me. She helps. Yeah, she helps me. Does she bring to you, her own detriment, I would Does add. she bring you, because your feet seem firmly on the ground. That's what I've noticed here. Does she help you keep your feet firmly on the ground? Yeah, she's she's one of my anchors yeah. along with my son. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I'm quite. I, I, I've somehow found a nice balance between mm. ambition and peace. Yeah, and you know, I think this isn't talked about enough actually. Yeah. But I think having a good relationship, a deep relationship, yeah. is so worth the work. Yeah. You know, I think it's so easy to think, you know, lots, lot, lot, most influencers have lots of women around them yeah. and they're jumping from woman to woman. Somehow that's actually a trophy. Yeah. I think the real trophy is having a deep, long-term relationship. Behind it's every not good pra- man. It's not praised behind enough. Behind every good man. Yeah, behind every good woman as well. Absolutely. You know, like, I really believe with all my heart that that is probably my biggest achievement, yeah. having a successful marriage. It's not, Same. It's not pitched as, as, as a, a milestone for success. Yeah. But, but it, it should, should be. It should be. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Simon, so, I've really, really enjoyed this episode. Well, I, I've enjoyed it too. Thank you for yeah. uh, letting me share my story. Yeah, you're a real, real good man. And I think there's massive stuff coming ahead. And I think what you're doing to help people and the positivity that you're giving that I'm seeing on TikTok and seeing on you, the positivity that's getting out there is infectious. I think you're going to have a lot of people behind you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're a gentleman. Appreciate Got you. Got a lot Likewise. of time for you, mate. That's kind of you to say. Good man, Simon. Cheers, mate.